Yeah, thank you everyone and welcome the panelists and the attendees to day three of our workshop from SAG. Today's session will be the seismic application of AI in acquisition, processing and interpretation. And my name is Raja Zatle and I will be jointly co-chairing this with Hassan Askarov. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Hassan Asgarov, uh, Exploration and Geohazards team leader at Amid Public Operating Company in Azerbaijan. I'd like to welcome everyone, and um, well, hopefully we will have a, a great uh, conference, great, great talk today. So, yeah, uh, my name is uh, Thomas Dionja. Uh, I am uh, from the University of uh, Bergen. And today uh, I will talk about source and receiver deghosting using demigration-based uh, supervised learning. Uh, just to begin uh, a little basic, uh, normally when we do a marine seismic acquisition, we have uh, we have a vessel that uh, usually tows uh, this seismic source and and the hydrophones behind it. And uh, each time this uh, uh, source is firing, uh, energy is uh, 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 propagates into the earth and is uh, some of that energy is then reflected and goes back to to the these hydrophone uh, hydrophones where it is uh, recorded and uh, uh, for each of these shots you get uh, you get these shot gathers and then if you do this over a distance you you will get kind of uh, an image of the subsurface that is usually the goal the main goal with these uh, seismic acquisitions <clears throat> Just to show you a little bit about uh, the the source that is usually used, it's a seismic source. It uh, fires uh, over pressured air into uh, into the water, uh, uh, which uh, expands uh, rapidly, and then uh, it kind of oscillates a little bit. The goal is, of course, to have a very like sh a sharp and short signal, uh, uh, but uh, we also get some some uh, low frequency noise uh, which we call the bubble uh, another unwanted effect uh, with seismic uh, energy in water is the ghost uh, the ghost is basically a reflection from the sea surface that means that uh, the energy that travels upwards uh, will be reflected at the sea surface um, with a polarity shift so on the source side you will get uh, uh, you will get uh, one uh, ghost reflection and also on the, re the rece receiver side. That means that you will not only get uh, this uh, first, uh, let's call it the primary, uh, which is just downwards to a reflector point and then upwards through the, to the receiver. You also get a source ghost, a receiver ghost, and also a combination uh, source and receiver ghost. So uh, you get uh, an, an elongated and you get a distorted uh, seismic signature, which is unwanted. Uh, in addition to this, uh, in the amplitude spectrum, we get uh, peaks and notches because of the way uh, the, this first arrival and the ghost uh, uh, interfere with each other. So some uh, frequencies will be boosted and others will be greatly attenuated. And uh, this is uh, not uh, wanted. The notch uh, is is very important because uh, because here we lose basically lose energy and uh, it's hard to recover this energy later. Uh, the notch is dependent on the depth of the source and receiver, so it means that if we have a, a deeper, let's say, a deeper receiver, then the receiver notch will also uh, be at a lower frequency. Uh, it's important to remove the ghost uh, for, for example, uh, seismic inversion and uh, also to just make a clear picture uh, of the subsurface. So it's easier for, for example, to interpret uh, the data later. Just to show you kind of the uplift you can get uh, with this, I, I show here a, a seismic image where the ghost is, uh, is included. You can see that on the left side. And on the right side, you can see how much better it is when you remove the ghost, where it's actually, you are able to see clearly the events. And so the ghosts uh, have uh, been uh, tackled before. I mean, there are several ways to, to attenuate the ghost. Uh, there are some, some acquisition methods. 
uh, for example, a shallow cable uh, where you basically uh, have a uh, have a very yeah you have a shallow receiver which pushes the notch to a very high frequency. You can use a slanted cable that uh, means that you have receivers the de the depth of the receivers they increase with uh, offset. Uh, when you stack this together, you you attenuate the receiver ghost and uh, multi component cable are also able to attenuate the receiver ghost. Uh, however, despite these acquisition methods, you still need to do processing or that's usually done. Uh, the most simple method is probably deconvolution, uh, but most commonly used is different types of inversion uh, methods. Uh, and there are, are several of these uh, in the literature. Uh, however, we, we, propose to, uh, an, we propose a new workflow that involves training a convolutional neural network on demigrated data with the goal to remove the ghosts. We call this method uh, DAGDAM. It stands for de-ghosting using demigration-based supervised learning. And um, <clears throat> this next slide here shows kind of the, the workflow that we uh, use. So uh, normally in, in a, you, uh, when we do processing, we get the, the raw data from the field, uh, perhaps some processing have been done to it uh, prior to uh, or after leaving the, the vessel, but uh, we do denoising, deblending, de-signature, and so on. And then later, uh, de-ghosting is done to the data, de-multiple. Uh, then you do several operations, uh, among others, interpolation, regularization, migration. And then you stack this uh, these data together to get uh, what we call a a pre-stack that migrated image and this image is uh, what uh, often is the kind of the final product uh, often it is that then uh, that can be used for example for interpreting uh, uh, geology however we we want to use this image to create training data uh, we use demigration which is I will go more into depth on that but it's the inverse of migration and uh, with demigration we can create the synthetic shot gathers with ghost and uh, without ghosts and this data is used to train a convolutional neural network as i mentioned uh, uh, migration uh, demigration is the inverse process of uh, migration and uh, for you, for those of you who are not familiar with migration uh, what you usually do is to go uh, from the recorded seismic data in the time domain and you transform that into the depth domain uh, and also with the goal to uh, correctly position the reflectors in the subsurface. Uh, with this method, we can model both primaries and ghosts, uh, which we will use to for the, the training data. Yeah, so a little bit about uh, the, the network. It's a unit structure. It's not uh, uh, very special. It's based on a uh, this this uh, particular uh, structure is uh, uh, it uses these um, convolutional layers together with uh, downsampling, where you can, for example, use uh, max pooling, uh, and then later you you upsample the data, uh, for example, with uh, transposed convolution. Uh, in addition, you also have these skip uh, connections that uh, basically copy these feature maps from uh, one layer to another. Uh, this this particular network has been proven to be fairly good in in a few other papers. That's the reason why I chose this. And uh, in this case, we have uh, just the, just the way it works is that we have uh, data with ghosts. It goes into the network. The network then predicts the data without the ghosts. You compare it with uh, the truth, and you get some error with your prediction. And that error is used to basically correct it. The network and make the network uh, better and you do this over uh, many thousands of uh, shots hundreds of times usually so uh, we we want we want to try this on some synthetic data just to confirm that it works in this case uh, i uh, use a flat cable of uh, 20 meters and a source at seven meters we used the Marmusi model together with uh, finite difference modeling to create uh, synthetic shot gathers uh, with ghosts and without ghosts. And this data is then used to create this uh, pre-stack 
like uh, that migrated image that I talked about. And uh, from this image, you can create the training data with the migration. So you, we get uh, data without ghost and with ghost. Here you see basically just data, uh, uh, an image of the subsurface with, without the ghost. And here you can see how it looks like with the ghosts included. Here I, I will show the results. Uh, on the left side here, you can see a uh, common channel gather for the receiver number 15 uh, with ghosts. And on the right side, you see uh, without the ghosts. And this is the, the truth. And uh, what you see here is the finite difference data that we will apply the network to. Here we can see uh, uh, Dagdam, which is our proposed method. And if I flip now, you can see on the right side that uh, both of these, uh, uh, this uh, result is close to the truth. And on the left side here, you see that uh, the error is not that uh, large, I would say. Uh, it's also important to look at the amplitude spectrum because uh, if we look here, we see the black is the, the ghost, the red is the, the data without ghost, and then the blue is tagged them. Uh, we can see that. Uh, we are able to remove the ghost. We are able to fill the notch, which is very, very important. And then uh, overall, uh, it's a pretty good match between uh, uh, Dagdam and the data without ghosts. But we also want to, to check if this works on real data. So we have some real data from the North Sea uh, in the North uh, Viking Graben area. Uh, in this case, uh, we have a slanted cable uh, that I mentioned in the introduction. This is a cable where you have a, kind of a shape like this, where the depth of the receivers, they increase with the uh, offset. Uh, in addition to this, we have two sources and 12 cables, uh, which you can see, you can see the setup uh, here. And uh, I will show the results now in uh, constant channel gathers uh, for receiver 15 and 50 for gun one and cable six. In addition to this, we will also compare our results with uh, a conventional and fairly established uh, method by Pool et al. What you see on the left side here is data with ghosts for receiver 15. And on the right side, you see also data with ghosts, but for receiver 50. And uh, if I go now to the results, this is Dagdam. Uh, so Dagdam on the right for receiver 50 and Dagdam on the left for receiver 15. So if I flip now, uh, this is data with ghosts. One minute left. And this is data without ghosts. So it's able to remove uh, much of the, the noise, the ghost noise. Uh, we also have conventional deghosting, which shows uh, almost the same results, but maybe less clear. I also have some image, images here that uh, is uh, uh, kind of highlight some details here. Here we see uh, Dagdam uh, both, and then here we see the conventional method. Uh, but Dagdam is able to perhaps make a clearer image yeah, than uh, the conventional one. On the amplitude spectrum, we see that the, the, the Dagdam is the blue and uh, conventional is the green, and that Dagdam is able to fill the notch uh, better for both receiver 15 and 50. So just to conclude, uh, on synthetic data, we see that we are able to remove the ghost and fill the notch. On real data, uh, the results look pretty good. Uh, it's comparable with the, the conventional method, uh, perhaps even better in terms of uh, resolution and uh, in terms of uh, filling the notch. This method is quite easy to use. That's a plus, but uh, it's quite expensive uh, computationally wise. And you're also dependent on a reflectivity model. So that's uh, all I have. Uh, thank you for allowing me to present. and. Uh, if there are any questions, just uh, go ahead. The, the first question is, what is PSDM on slide seven? Uh, yeah, let me just go back to, to that slide. Perhaps I could have explained this a little bit better, but uh, a PSDM image is a pre-stacked depth migrated image. And uh, what that basically means that you, you do migration uh, from time to, to depth before you stack the data. Uh, and that means that you have the data in these offset classes that you migrate, and then uh, in the end you you stack it. And the stacking is usually done to uh, to get a um, uh, an image uh, with uh, less uh, or, or with better uh, signal to noise uh, ratio. 
So yeah, there is a question. Uh, why did you choose to use synthetic data instead of real data? Um, the reason why I chose to do this with uh, synthetic data is because that uh, it's it was uh, hard to to basically get good training data with real data. The the problem with um, is at least in my experience is that if you are to use real data, you need to to get data without ghost uh, and you can use other methods uh, to remove the ghost but the, uh, when you when you use your network to train on on these types of data you uh, you will not necessarily be, be better than than the conventional method that you are training on uh, with this synthetic data uh, which is created with demigration uh, demigration creates fairly complex uh, synthetic data. Uh, we actually, I mean, we see that it's able to do a pretty good job uh, even on real data as well. So what is the additional value by using CNN versus uh, the conventional methods? That's a question. Yeah, so so the, the main value I would say is, is the uplift that we see um, and just how easy it is to use. Uh, at least from my my experience, uh, these uh, some of the conventional methods they can be uh, uh, a lot of testing and uh, to to get a kind of a good results. Uh, with this method that I have here, it's it's fairly easy to use and to get even a, a good results. It's fairly easy to to do. Uh, which type of error message uh, error measure I have used and uh, I have basically used uh, a normalized uh, root mean square error and uh, I don't have that measure in here actually but uh, from these uh, these error measure uh, error measures uh, we see that uh, uh, Dagdam is uh, is doing a, a pretty good job uh, on real data we don't have this measure because we don't have the truth uh, but on synthetic data it's able to 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 do pretty good thank you Thomas then no more questions thank you for the talk so I'd like to welcome Jyoti Behra from Colorado School of Mines uh, and presenting the work on enhancing resolution of subsurface geophysical images using supervised deep learning. Welcome Jyoti. All right, so in this talk, uh, I'm going to introduce a machine learning based technique for enhancing resolution of uh, geophysical images. My, uh, besides uh, my colleague Manika Prasad at School of Mines, uh, my collaborators on this uh, work are Evan Um and da David Olimbo from uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Usually when we perform geophysical imaging, we obtain an image that is shown on the top right, an image that is of a lower resolution than that what we see in well logs. Our goal in this uh, research here is to employ machine learning so that we can enhance the resolution of this low resolution geophysical image to something that is close to that of well logs. And the advantages of that would be numerous, including more accurate reservoir simulation, uh, more accurate interpretation, and so on. Our goal here is to enhance the resolution of geophysical images to close to that uh, or obtained uh, by well logs. How do we do that? So, so this slide summarizes essentially the idea. So let's say when we have a subsurface, we can sample the same subsurface using two different techniques. One is a well log where we drill a well and uh, let's say make uh, measurements at particular intervals, uh, usually half a foot. That's shown by this blue line, blue curve. We sample the same subsurface using geophysical methods. In this case, seismic methods, which uh, because of the lower uh, frequencies involved, sample that subsurface at much lower frequencies and we get a low resolution image, but for the same subsurface. So these two techniques are sampling the same subsurface, but at different resolutions. So one can devise a mapping function to go between the low resolution geophysical image and the high resolution well log. And this can be done using multiple approaches. In this case, I start uh, with a one-dimensional approach 
for vertical wells, and then we'll show the results for two and three dimensional uh, images. So first one dimensional uh, approach. In this, as I already showed in the previous slide, the seismic trace along a vertical well becomes the input. And then along the same vertical well, there is a well log that becomes the output. And if we have multiple wells, we can now train the neural network on these inputs and outputs, come up with a deep learning model, and then apply that deep learning model to the whole volume of seismic data to enhance uh, its resolution. What are the pros? Multiple training examples are available in this case. Suppose we have uh, 100 wells, we can use all 100 wells to uh, train. And even wells that are outside of the region might possibly be used. Let us look at some results now. On the top, th this is the Kimberlina model. Oh, sorry, this is the Marmusi model. I will show you an example of the Kimberlina model at the end as well. On the top is the ground truth high resolution P wave velocity model. The bottom figure is a smooth version of it, which we can obtain using uh, geophysical imaging. And again, our job is to enhance the resolution of this low resolution uh, geophysical image. So when we apply this one dimensional uh, deep learning technique, here is what we get. On the bottom is the result of applying this technique using 10% of the data. That is in this case, 10% of the, the columns. What we see is that the method works pretty well. We are able to enhance the resolution quite, quite well, even in regions where there is lateral heterogeneity, that is somewhere in the middle. But uh, the, the issue, this works pretty well, but the issue is when we translate those 10% of the wells to the number of 10% of the data to the number of training wells, it turns out in this case, it's uh, 1360 training wells. And that's a lot. That's what's not practical uh, in the field. So instead of 1360 training wells, if we have just 160 training wells, which are shown here on the top figure, this is still dense sampling. And then the resolution enhancement is still there as shown by the bottom figure, especially uh, to the left and the right, where lateral heterogeneity is not strong. But in the middle, where there is strong lateral heterogeneity, the method is not working well. If we reduce the number of wells even further to just 16 wells, and we do not sample that the lateral heterogeneity in the training, then the method is not able to do much as can be seen from the output uh, in the bottom. And this is uh, kind of expected because we are using only the vertical information in, in training in, in the training wells. So there are multiple drawbacks of just using this one dimensional learning. First of all, it requires for it to work really well. It requires just too many wells. And there are issues honoring lateral discontinuities. We, not, we are not taking that lateral uh, discontinuity information into this training algorithm at all. And this works only for vertical wells that span the whole section from, let's say, from the top all the way to the bottom. And so well logs of limited or variable extent cannot be used in, in, in this method. And it also does not use the information, full geophysical information that's available in the, in the geophysical image. So it does not use the geological knowledge. To overcome this, these challenges involved in one dimensional learning, we perform multidimensional deep learning where we incorporate the whole geophysical image into training as, as can be depicted in this image. So now instead of vertical seismic traces as inputs, the input is the whole geophysical image. It can be two-dimensional or three-dimensional. And then the output is going to be an output of the same size as the input, except it has a weighting function where the weights are ones and zeros. 
wherever there is a well present, the weight is one, and wherever there is no weight, there, there is no well, the weight is zero. And the uh, during training, these output values along these masks correspond to the values that we get from well logs. So once we set this input and output, we can perform uh, uh, training. And once we train the network, we just don't have to apply this weight. We just apply the whole network on the input and we get a higher resolution image. Here are the pros and cons of this multidimensional method. It, this method, because it trains on the whole geophysical volume uh, at the same time, it honors geology. It is able to handle well logs of any geometry, even if they're uh, lateral wells, even if they're truncated in space, which is uh, mostly the case. The only drawback is there's only one training example because uh, we have only one model. Let us now look at some uh, results from this multidimensional approach. Here we use, uh, here are the results of using only 16 wells. Previously, we see, had seen that in the one-dimensional approach, using 16 wells did not yield uh, any enhancement in resolution. But now we see that with the multidimensional approach, even with using just 16 wells, the figure in the bottom shows that vertical resolution has been enhanced. Horizontal resolution is still an issue at places, especially at uh, uh, zones with strong lateral heterogeneity. If we increase the number of wells to 160, where we are now sampling the regions in the middle with, more, with strong lateral heterogeneity better, the results are much more improved. Next, I show the Kimberlina example, which has been extensively studied by uh, my colleagues at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and the uh, National Energy Technology Laboratory in the US. So here, instead of the conventional, let's say, VP image or a seismic image, we are looking at enhancing the resolution of a uh, petrophysical attribute, in this case, CO2 saturation. So using seismic and CSEM data, my colleagues have generated a map of CO2 saturation, and that's what's shown here. One corresponds to a CO2 saturation value of 100%, and zero means there's, there's no CO2 at that particular uh, uh, grid point. Using seismic and CSEM, CSEM inversion, we obtain this image, which is a smooth. So uh, to train this, to enhance its resolution, we use four well logs whose trajectories are given here. These are all vertical well logs, but they are truncated uh, in depth and they end, all of them end at around three kilometers in depth. And here, and this image here in the bottom shows the CO2 values. It's kind of difficult to see because there are just a few pixels, but the arrows point to where the CO2 values are non-zero. So using just this data, using these two figures, the top one being the just input one minute left. and the bottom one being the output of the training network, we perform the training and then apply the whole model to this more geophysical image. Now this bottom figure shows the output of uh, that uh, deep learning model applied to this uh, smooth geophysical image. There are two things that I would like to point out here. First is we have achieved our primary goal of enhancing the resolution, where obviously this resolution is much higher than uh, the input geophysical image. Uh, moreover, uh, and very importantly, the values of saturations. Here is the injection well at X of around two kilometers. This, the CO2 saturation at this location is uh, one uh, at all the depth injection points. And that's what we see from uh, the application of uh, this technique as well. So we are not able to, not only able to enhance its resolution, we obtain accurate values of the CO2 saturation as well. So in conclusion, the one dimensional method uh, works good at uh, enhancing the vertical resolution. 
However, it shows poor lateral uh, continuity yeah, and it needs really numerous, numerous wells to work. We overcome all these challenges by using the whole uh, three-dimensional or two-dimensional geophysical image as uh, uh, input in the training. Although that means that we have only one training example, but the, the, the resolution enhancement is reasonable in this case, uh, as it honors lateral uh, variations in geology and it can handle the logs of any geometry. There might be challenges where there are strong lateral discontinuities. If there are uh, well logs that sample those lateral discontinuities, those are the cases uh, uh, you obtain the best results. We'd like to thank uh, the US Department of Energy, as well as members of the Center for Rock and Multi uh, Fluid Multiphysics at uh, Colorado School of Mines, as well as uh, our colleagues at NETL and EDX for helping us with many of the data issues. With that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. What are these training wells? Um, are they just outputs from ground truth? Uh, yes, in this, in this case, uh, good question. In this case, the training wells are just sampled points from the ground truth. Okay, do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, just uh, I think that's uh, so. I think as far as I understand, this has all been tried on a training data set, right? It hasn't been tried in, in elsewhere on the seismic data. So this is like a velocity or something, a, 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 a geological model, right? Right. Then, reconstructed so you haven't really tried it on a seismic data set okay so like you reflectivity or, yeah uh, no we haven't tried that but that's the next stage we, if you go, that's a good question because currently we are working exactly on that uh, using uh, the uh, data re released by equinor on dot c yeah, there are some publicly available data to do this, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and because they have in the, uh, released the stack sections or the stack sections along with well logs, which is ideal for uh, this case. Okay, yeah. Yes, okay. so the next question is, the well data have different sampling rate compared to seismic. Have you applied any smoothing methods on the wells? Would you provide details about the used deep learning approach, like number of layers, nodes, optimal. Yes, I can provide that right now. This is a simple uh, unit with all convolutional uh, neural networks. That is, there's nothing fancy here. Uh, so it's the conventional neural network uh, C, uh, unit. And uh, as far as sampling is concerned, yes, the sampling between bell logs and seismic uh, is, is different. So what we do is, say you have well logs sampled at half a foot and you have a seismic image uh, output from seismic imaging at 50 meter resolution. So you can always resample that 50 meter resolution to like uh, half a meter or more to match the resolution of that of a uh, uh, well log. And that way you overcome the the disparity in resolution uh, in sampling challenges. Uh, next question is, what do you mean by two-dimensional, three-dimensional uh, deep learning model? Okay, in one-dimensional model, the input is a column, column of uh, seismic data, let's say, uh, and the output is same, a column along a well log. In two or three-dimensional uh, deep learning model, the inputs, are going to be the whole two or three dimensional seismic volume or velocity volume, whatever you have. And you use evolutional neural network, which uses two or three dimensional kernels. And then the output is also the same dimension as the input. That's what we mean by this two or three dimensional machine learning model. Next question, many geophysical images are smooth either because of inversion method used or survey limitations. Also, the contrasts frontiers may not represent the limit of structures and subsurface. So enhancing this image could cause artifacts and lead to bad interpretation. How can you avoid this? Uh, very good question. Un unfortunately, uh, we, we cannot do much about this. If we, if we have all heard of garbage in, garbage out. If I input 
garbage into use garbage as input uh, i will not get any stuff really out of uh, out of the, the the method if the image has is not good then the output uh, might not be good but uh, we we are currently testing some of those uh, things right now because we believe that if there are systematic systematic errors in the input the method might still work for example if there are issues due to multiples then the method might still still work but that's still under uh, testing right now uh, so one uh, if anyone has any questions please feel free to just uh, email me or we can chat uh, on this text all right thanks jyoti so i'd like to welcome luke sandevi from earth resource management services to present earth intelligence for automating structured modeling i'm nick from jivi evangelist in earth intelligence and um, i just uh, recall that we are today at the digital age because the computing cost got down and the computing power is today uh, increasingly uh, is increasing we are at the log scale so it means very exponential development and uh, just to recall that I had my first course in geostatistics in uh, 75. Excuse, and, uh, excuse I, I me, Luke. I apologize, there's one typing, I think. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Right. Please, everyone, uh, mute their microphones. Okay, so I, I said that I started my first course in geostat in uh, 1975. I had my PhD thesis in 87. At the time, the computing was just at the beginning. And in 2020, I registered the Earth intelligence concept to differentiate from standard uh, neural network based uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So let's a few words to introduce uh, uncertainty and the NP decision making. This is what I call the you do more diagram. It goes like this. At the time of making decisions, operators uh, always face uncertainty because the data they have to answer the question never fully represent the actual full reservoir of resource. This is what I call uncertainty on data as figured as do axis on this diagram. To compensate for the lack of or now in the accuracy of data, operators need model, models to support decision making. And because again of uncertainty, the model will never equal exactly the reality. This is the uncertainty on model figured as the more axis on the Udemy diagram. So you understand that dealing with uncertainty is at the heart of the reservoir decision making and management. What is the issue with uncertainty? The issue with uncertainty is because of uncertainty, there is an inevitable gap between expected values that you get from your model and resulting uh, values that you get after drilling or uh, uh, operating the resource, okay? And the, the resulting KPIs on the decisions, exploration success, production plans, reserve estimates, are always lower than ideal KPIs that would have been obtained in the ideal but unrealistic case of no uncertainty, that's for sure. So it means that uncertainty always means a loss in terms of project economical value. So the issue with uncertainty is a multi-million dollar economics. What is the uncertainty challenge? The challenge we face with uncertainty is the ability of quantifying uncertainty on data, that is on the measurement or on the processing uncertainties or errors, to be able to consistently propagate this uncertainty on data and feed the model when quantifying, quantifying uncertainty on the model, then being able to anticipate and minimize the always negative economical impact of uncertainty on the project economical value. And at the end, being able to validate what we have found from the reservoir and uh, check it with what we had as a confidence interval uh, from the model. So the uncertainty challenge is our challenge, is a technical challenge. And the solution we have for that is that been like this for years, is uh, geostatistics or Kriging or probability models. Kriging algo minimize what we call the estimation error. It means that in this model, probability model, if we call Z of X the reality, the, the property of the reservoir, we build estimate, Kriging estimate, Z star of X model, okay? And we minimize this uh, estimation is minimizing 
the difference between the Z star and Z of X. As we don't know the reality, we cannot have access to this estimation error, but we can minimize it using the probability theory. Minimizing this error means that on average, this error, if you drill many wells, for example, you will find that this error should be zero and the variance, this is dispersion of these errors around zero should be minimum. This is the definition of the Kriging operator. So uh, Kriging algorithm quantify and minimize uncertainty in path. And there are many of them. And you know, most of you know already about your statistics and see how it evolved. In the eighties, season one, I call, Kriging was seen as an interpolator, consistently integrating seismic and well data and providing uncertainty map on the results. And at the time, it was very time consuming and uh, uh, computer uh, power consuming. So it was not really spread. In the uh, 2000, in season two, a uh, pregame was uh, developed as a spatial data conditional, meaning, for example, you've got here a uh, seismic velocity field, PSDM uh, velocity field, and the pregame technique could filter this velocity field and provide you with depth residual and velocity artifact. So it was addressing the uncertainty challenge in the data quality, but the geophysicists had all the focus on developing more advanced uh, PSDM technology at the time. So now is the time because in 2020, Kriging appears as a powerful machine learning algorithm that consistently optimizes uh, parameters of geomodeling workflows and it addresses the full uncertainty challenge. So in season three today, Kriging algos are used as machine learning algorithm thanks to uh, computer po computing power available. So what I define as uh, Earth intelligence is a specific part of AI applied to geodata, data with coordinates. It's based on a mathematical uh, theory developed by Hodge Macron in the 70s. And the main point is this AI technology use uncertainty estimation error as the, co the lost cost function to be min minimized by the, by the algorithm. So we are not checking our results against the data we feed into the model. We are checking the result, the result against what you will find when you drill. And so you have a number of pretty based machine learning algorithm. And the result is that we provide estimation with confidence interval or simulation that you, you would call them ensemble-based method today with reliable P10, P50, P90 confidence interval and all in a single run. So let's see some examples about this uh, AI. A very simple case, for example, in exploration case where you've got three interpreted uh, horizon and the target is the third one, okay? You've got a background access to a seismic velocity field and you've got a set of eight, eight well depth markers, whether with VSP or sonic or without them. And the challenge you have to face is to map this uh, in depth, these uh, targets, compute the volumetrics of the, of the prospect and develop alternative P10, P50, P90 structural depth case. In the current life with uh, the current uh, platforms, what you would do in Petrel, define a layer, uh, define the top interpretation, define the well markers that you're going to use, and define the velocity loads that you want to test or apply for this uh, each of these layers. For example, constant velocity using the safe speed velocity rescaling and the VNOD K uh, compaction effect. The problem is this, say, uh, how will you justify your choice to your management when you present results? How do you justify your layering definition? How do you justify the interval velocity lows? And most of all, how do, can you justify the parameters uh, you get uh, you, you have input? And uh, if you've got sonic logs, and that, that's good. But even with sonic logs, it's hard to justify. So when you use this platform, Earth Intelligent Platform, you would start with the same scenario, but the interface would be slightly different You've got the scenario you want to test. You've chosen the velocity interval velocities from a set of available uh, testable velocity lows. And uh, at, the, at the same time, you choose the, ve the velocity lows. The software computes the best parameterization of V node A and V node K 
in order to best match the, all the input uh, well markers you have input into your system. It means that at the same time, interactively, without computing anything else, uh, the bias and frigging, just that, will compute the uh, best uh, post, uh, posteriori uh, optimized uh, parameters for your velocity node. Optimized meaning that they minimize the uh, they minimize the error means that on average the error is very near to zero, and the standard deviation of the error at the wells uh, is very is the smallest one, and you've got of course the all the mismatch table for all the layers and all the well. So this is how it goes. So it means that this scenario enables you to test alternative scenario and to justify your choice of parameters. When you have to support this decision-making on this case, whether you don't have access to, uh, uh, to uh, Sonic and you may be completely out of the game, maybe you are, you've got access to Sonic logs, PSV, and you may get, a, this is a very effective curve, and you get a, a reasonable P50, but you are unable to uh, cor correctly anticipate P90, P10, and if you use uh, geostatistics and Earth intelligence solution, you would get the full realistic uh, expectation curve. Earth intelligence solution is able to scan the full space of alternative layering and interval velocity loads. It enables to optimize velocity loan parameters and provide consistent P10, P15, P90 depth space. A uh, more advanced case, in this case, you get a, a, a field with a uh, four, five, five uh, wells, a, a, a well with an unknown contact that's supposed to fit to the spin point. B is a processing wells uh, separate from A, you know it's separate from A. C, the contact is uncertain. D, producing wells except for the D3. And L, a legacy dry well with no picture. And the data you have to, to, so to, uh, to answer the issue is a 20 by 20 uh, kilometer seismic survey, seven array interpreted, three vertical, and nine deleted wells. The challenge is to provide a depth map of the top reservoir, a reservoir probability map, meaning the GRV, the, the closure probability maps, and P10, P90, P50, P90 case. In this case, what you would do, uh, most probably you would go and code your workflow, your in-house workflow, on Petrel or other software, but uh, to code uh, this uh, workflow, it uh, requires advanced coding skills. Uh, not many geophysicists are able to do that by themselves. They would need data scientists or uh, specialists. And in any case, it would take weeks to run uh, this project. And the output, most of that is the most over. The output would be a black box. It's a numerical model output that is hard to justify well, the data involved and how you process them. If you go for Earth intelligent platform, you have the opportunity to automate your workflow, saying I want a depth conversion, then I want some volumetrics on platform B, B, and A. It requires no uh, coding skill, that's for everybody, and it takes hours to run a project as it is AI. And most of all, the, at the end, you report your scenario, it's stressable. One minute left. What is the scenario? It is the combination of the data, the workflow that you're using, and the challenge you want to solve. In the scenario, you've got the time data, marker data, and all the velocity data, and the predict will optimize all that. And you get all your uh, scenario for computing uh, volumetrics at the end. In a run, you get all the closure probability maps and all the geology. So just to uh, summarize, the KPIs on Earth intelligence were provided by Eric Andersen at the end of 2021. Eric is the head of Geoscience Solution and Digital Transformation in Petronas, and he reported a uh, success story of AI in his next-gen program. Next-gen program in Petronas is for testing AI and new technology at the digital, digital age. And he said, well, uh, on two projects, on two projects, he said that the project turnaround time was uh, reduced by two, and they improved the asset team efficiency by 80% and limited uh, peer assistance by 80%. So it leads to enhance workflow and demonstrate technical excellence. So we are, as a conclusion, we are at the digital age, and this uh, Earth intelligence 
meaning geostats, okay, the, the same prelim that in the, in the 75 that you advanced. It allows for quantifying and propagating uncertainty at each step of the workflow. It consistently, using probabilistic model, address the technical uncertain challenges and solve with uncertainty economic issues in reservoir management. And more, more, moreover, it disrupts the geomodeling geo processes by replacing black box numerical model by traceable automated P10, P9, P50, P90 scenario running in real time. Thank you for attention. I'm open of course for any questions. I think uh, some folks are wondering whether uh, is Earth Intelligence a software application or the name of a company? That, that's um, the answer is that a, a artificial intelligence is usually seen as a processing big data, big data sets using neural network. The the the, the cost function uh, you you minimize in the standard neural network is the comparison between your, your uh, results and the data, okay? This is the difference you are trying to, you, you are minimizing using your neural network. With uh, probabilistic models, we are minimizing another cost function. It's, it's not no more related to data, it's related to the reality, to the reservoir. We are minimizing, uh, we are providing a uh, modeling, automating, the parameterization of geo models uh, by minimizing the difference that you are going to, to face when you drain. So it's a, a specific part of AI. That's why I call it uh, AI to differentiate. Another question, what is the final output? Um, geologic reservoir depth model? Yes, in, in, this, uh, in this presentation, we, uh, in this presentation, we are uh, automating this workflow, for example, uh, people have to face some structural issues. In, in example here, they want to know what is the overall GRV that they have on the reservoir. And to do that, they usually use this uh, workflows that is done by hand, okay? And that they run to uh, replicate the workflow on their data. And uh, here, what we propose is to automate, to automate using AI, to automate what they would do by hand. Automated because all the parameterization of the velocity model of the layering is done by the software. It's scanning all the possibility of layering of uh, using velocity loads. It's, it's uh, scanning the, this whole uh, domain to select the best choice automatically. All right. Good, good afternoon, morning, and evening <laughs> to everyone. Thank, <clears throat> thank you for joining today's session on seismic applications of AI in acquisition processing and interpretation. So my name is uh, Hassan Asgar from Exploration and Geohazards, uh, team leader at MIG Babek Operating Company here in Baku, Azerbaijan. Um, I will lead this session along with Artyom Sazikin, who is Schlumberger Area Geophysicist. Um, so we have overall five talks in this session and about an hour and a half to cover this. Uh, the first talk is on one big convolutional neural network with stacked bidirectional long short term memory for seismic impedance conversion, and that will be presented by Shang Kuang. Uh, so, Shang, if you are ready, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. Um, hey, everyone. Um, thanks for joining this talk. So, my name is Shang Huang, and I'm from the University of Calgary. And today, the topic is on 1D convolutional neural network with stacked bidirectional long short term memory for seismic impedance inversion. Um, for this talk, first I will give a brief introduction on the background and then following with the workflow um, theory results and the final part is conclusion of future work. First is the background. So this work is done on 2021 Houston GSH Geophysics on Cloud Computation, which is sponsored by AWS Energy and Thought. And this work, um, like the seismic acquisition was originally um, down in 2009 by Konoko Phillips. And you can see on the right-hand side, here's the 3D seismic survey, which is the Poseidon 3D area. And the data was chosen from there. And the data given includes the near, mid, far offsite seismic, the migration velocity and well logs, which has like um, six IDs, um, including the compressional travel time, shared travel time, density, gamma ray, resistivity, and caliper. And our target is to do the impedance inversion. Uh, which is the velocity times with the density. Okay, so on the right-hand side, I've put an example of well log number one at incline um, 2983. 
for the first three columns are near, mid, far, um, seismic, uh, offset seismic, and following with the background velocity, which is uh, pretty smooth. And the next part is uh, compressional travel time, shared travel time, and density. But we could look at the last two columns. There are many like missing values there. Um, the necessary step after like using pre-processing is to do the imputation, uh, which is uh, filling the missing values with predictions. And for the workflow, we have three steps and our work is mainly focusing on the third step, which is the model construction and training. But in this talk, um, I'd like to give a brief introduction about the feature engineering and also give the result of imputation. So for feature engineering, uh, we have two goals. The first one is to characterize the sequences and indicate amplitude anomalies, uh, which can direct to the lithology variation. And the other one is to estimate the seismic attenuation, uh, which could provide potential oil and gas reservoir position. And for uh, features we've chosen, including the stack seismic, um, some of near mid far offsites, intercept and gradients, instantaneous amplitude and phase, and so on. Those features are widely used in geological and structural and stratigraphic um, um, indication, and also can be measured during the um, geologic intervals. And for the imputation part, um, after combining the geology knowledge and also some regression models, um, the missing values are like predicted uh, with proper way. And we've chosen part of the input sequences, um, like near, mid, far offset, and also the background velocity, um, the integral, instantaneous amplitude, um, instantaneous frequency. So those traces are corresponding with each other, uh, which can direct to some significant reflectors. So we will use those as the input traces for training. Okay, so let's move on to the step three. In this step, we've deployed like two models. One is using the stacked bidirectional long short term memory, and the other one is combining the 1D convolutional neural network and plus the stacked um, bidirectional long short term memory. Before diving into the detailed workflow, um, we could give some um, definition of uh, recurrent neural network and long short term memory, and also bidirectional long short term memory, and also the convolutional neural network. Um, recurrent neural network is a type of artificial neural network. But the difference between feed forward and recurrent neural network is that the feed forward one, the inputs and outputs are independent with each other. But for the um, recurrent neural network, because it's a um, self loop um, architecture, we can see like in this figure, the um, output of the previous step will influence the next step, input and output. And for the long short term memory as a type of recurrent neural network, it also can um, uh, like compute and uh, um, control the sequential data or time series data. But the, different, but the difference is that it has a like special memory cell that has different gates. So those gates can um, capturing like longer dependencies or terms compared with the recurrent neural network, which can be used for like using in the uh, long and the sample, uh, like densely sampled well log data. And if we zoom in, into the long short term memory, uh, long short term memory unit, uh, we could see there are four gates like forget gate, um, input gate, the candidate gate, and output gate. So those four gates can regulate the flow of inputs and outputs of the soil. So the inputs, including the memory from last unit, uh, which is CT minus one, also known as the cell state, and output of last uh, unit. H T minus one, which is the hidden state, uh, and also the current input. For the output, it has the new updated memory C T and current output H T. So we could also see like other activation layers, for example, the sigmoid uh, layer and tangent layer. We also use the scaling information and adding information. So the new updated memory C T and the current output H T are derived from like those inputs combined with like different gates. Some gates will let the cell remember uh, like longer dependencies and some will like forget some memory for like temporary and further will use it again. And for bi-directional long short term memory. So um, it is based on the long short term memory, but it has two units. Um, one is for like forward direction and the other one is for backwards direction. 
and also it is well suited to classifying, processing, and making predictions based on time series data. And both long short-term memory and bidirectional long short-term memory can have relative sensitivity to gap length um, compared with the recurring neural network. Um, for example, like if we want to predict the sequence after 1,000 points, not 10, not 100, but 1,000 points, um, the long short-term memory and bidirectional long short-term memory can like remember that and make the correct prediction because it has a like special cell structure like we showed just now. Um, but the recurrent neural network cannot do that and will forget from the um, starting point. And for the 1D convolutional neural network, in this work, uh, we've put the time series as the input um, combined with like different features we talked about just now, and then put it into the convolution layer. And this is for like the key feature extraction, and then put it into the max pooling layer for down sampling and extracting the outputs with smaller dimensions. And final part is the um, fully connected layer with a dense layer to output our predictions, um, the P impedance and S impedance in this case. In our proposed method, we combine 1D convolutional neural network uh, for feature extraction and also the stacked bidirectional long short term memory for sequence prediction. And from a high level plan on the right hand side, you can see there are like three dimensions. Um, for the horizontal dimension or the horizontal um, direction, we could see it is the well IDs. Um, in this project, we only have like six well logs for training and testing. So yeah, so the horizontal direction is for like different well IDs. And then the vertical direction is the time series. Time series um, combining like um, over 3000 milliseconds. So it is for like stacked by directional long short term memory to let it learn how to predict the later sequential data. And the other, uh, another direction is for the features. The features including, like we mentioned, the instantaneous amplitude, um, frequency, the um, near mid far offside seismic data. Those are for the 1D CobNet for feature um, or the key pattern learning. And here's the like detailed workflow. We have the inputs like including different features or seismic attributes, and then put it into the conf 1D blocks, has like three CobNets, and then fed it into the stacked by directional long short memory for training uh, and prediction. And final part is the dense layer and have our output or prediction. In this part, please note that P impedance and S impedance are calculated separately because we want to avoid uh, um, the interference. Okay, so uh, for the model building, we have the baseline model set as um, the extreme gradient boosting regressor. And for model number one, which is uh, stacked by directional long short term memory only, and model two is combining the 1D convolutional neural network plus the stacked by directional long short term memory. And the evaluation matrix, we choose to use the R square value, uh, which is one minus the sum of squares of residual on the top and divided by the sum of a uh, total sum of squares. And next part, I will introduce or describe the results, like the predictions of P wave velocity, S wave velocity, P, uh, P impedance, and S impedance. Also, we'll provide another option, uh, which is using the median filter to remove out some unexpected noise or spikes. So. For P wave impedance, uh, sorry, P wave uh, velocity prediction, um, we could see on the figure the blue line means the true value, and red dashed line means the extreme gradient boosting prediction. And orange dashed line is our method one, which is using only the stacked bi directional long short to memory. And green start line is our method two, um, combining the convolutional neural network and the stacked bidirectional long short term memory. We could see from the um, red dash line, uh, which is an extreme gradient boosting regressor, the result is um, like partly recovered the trace, but uh, we could see between 2800 to 3000 milliseconds. Uh, the pre prediction is quite smooth um, and cannot provide any like useful information for the um, like lithology variations. But on the other hand side, um, our method one, the stacked bidirectional long short memory in the orange dash line can give more details compared with the right dash line. But on the other hand side, we could see some like unexpected spikes. Um, but we could 
like talk it later for removing it. Um, and for the green start line, based on like giving more details about the prediction, also it can um, give the indication for different um, layer boundaries. You can see like for um, this layer, you can see the amplitude drop and here the same amplitude drop and this one is amplitude increase. So it's pretty clear. And also uh, at around like three thousand milliseconds, it can provide more um, details on those like rapid change areas. And also here's the drop and the green start line, our method two can also recover it properly. And the R square value, uh, which is the highest one, um, like 0.257. Um, here's the interesting thing. The R square value in this project, it kind of uh, lower than other projects because we have like insufficient data set. We only have like six well logs for training and testing. Um, that is the reason why the R square value is kind of lower. Um, but if you think on the other hand side, the method two, like combining the convolutional neural network and stacked by directional loss to memory can recover most of part of the trees. So it's um, like improvement or can be regarded as a reference for like further interpretation. And here's the like share wave velocity prediction. This result is better than the P wave prediction. Um, like the green start line and the orange dash line are more like close to the true value and also um, gives the less like artifacts. And here's the like P impedance prediction. So um, similar to the P wave velocity prediction, but here uh, the green star line can like give a more like better performance and alignment for the prediction compared with the um, extreme gradient boosting, like the same, the right dash line is blocky and uh, smooth and cannot say or fairly say anything about the uh, impedance inversion. And also the model two has the highest value for the R squared value. And this is a shear impedance prediction. So um, except for like those benefits that the uh, stacked by directional long short memory has, uh, we could see like there's some unexpected noise or spikes appearing. We were thinking about like how to remove it or kind of remove it um, for our prediction. We tried one way, like to use the median filter. The benefit is that we remove or mitigate those artifacts. But however, um, we found the high frequency terms just um, being filtered out as well. But after all, like compi um, compare the model one and model two with the baseline model, we could see like they are also get like better results and more like a higher accuracy for the prediction along the trees. And similar for the shear impedance after using the median filter, the change for like lithology variation can be seen more clearly for both method one and two compared with the baseline model. So um, in conclusion, um, both stacked by directional long short memory and one deconvolutional neural network plus the stacked by directional long short memory could help to predict velocity and impedance with good fit when we have few well logs. For example, like in this case, we only have like six well logs, which is quite like small amount of data. And one DCN plus uh, stacked by directional long short memory could extract key features for inversion and have ability to capture the temporal dependencies. And results from the method two on the rock boundary indication can help with further interpretation when given insufficient data sets. And in the future work, we will try to use the proposed method on different geology models and also find a way to like reduce the unexpected spikes. So I would like to thank Marcelo, Daniel, David, Brain, John, Jen, Kai, and Luping for valuable um, suggestion and also pre-processing the data. And we'd like to thank Data Science and Machine Learning SAG for hosting the um, competition and thank Cruise industrial sponsors, student staff, and CERC and CSC. And here are some references. And thank you so much. Um, any questions? Oh, I saw a question in the Q&A bar. What would have the effect of using a standard long short term memory uh, versus the bi directional one? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So. At the beginning, um, we tried to use a standard long short term memory, just uh, one direction, but from um, there are many like spikes. Probably the parameters we choose is quite 
small or large, which is like um, 512. Yeah, so that probably not um, properly used in this project, but probably it could be used like in the other um, projects when using like having more data sets. It's worth like trying and testing. All right. Thank you for your presentation. Just a quick one. I think you mentioned that your S impedance uh, outputs were kind of more stable compared to P impedance. Uh, is that correct? Uh, and if that's correct, what, what 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 do you think is the reason behind that? Is it um, well, basically the fact that shear wave doesn't react to the um, hydrocarbons to the fluids? Or? Yeah. So um, that's a great question. So we're thinking about that. Uh, one thing is that. Because you could see, I've put a figure. Yeah, I've put a figure here. It's just a one well log. Probably in like other well logs, the missing value in the compressional travel time is larger than that in the shear travel time. That could be one reason for generating that the um, shear impedance is better than the P impedance. And the other thing probably is about like density uh, as well, uh, because this computation uh, only gives us like six well logs. Um, part of the data are missing. Um, so most of the data are predicted by like regression and uh, Gardner equation and also other like geology knowledge by our teammates. So um, it could manually generate some minor um, artifacts, I would say. Yeah, the result shows that the shear impedance is better than the compressional impedance. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. And another one, do you mean if you have had well, a more, well, lots more, more data, you would need artificial law short term memory? Um, you could try it. Like, um, I haven't like tried to use both long short term memory and bidirectional long, long short term memory for larger data sets. Um, but I would say normally the bidirectional long short term memory will work better than the long short term memory because it will learn like bidirectionally. Yeah, I would suggest to use the bidirectional one first. And if it cannot work better, or yeah, you could change to like a standard one to see how it goes. Is it a test only, or do you believe it should be used in the real prayer? Because it's the, R. the R2 value is, that's true. The R2 value is quite low. Um, but I would say this is the real data, like acquisited uh, in Poseidon area. And the R2, right, the R2 is pretty low, but on the other hand side, R2 is not a force standard to measure if our prediction is like good or bad. It's just a reference. You can see like, even though the difference between the baseline model and model two um, in R2, uh, in R square value is kind of small, like less than 0.1, but um, you could see the extreme gradient boosting regressor just gave some blocky and smooth prediction. But the method two, uh, which is the convolutional neural network plus the stack by directional long short term long short term memory, sorry, it can have a more um, like better alignment along the traces. Yeah, it could be like becoming a reference for like further interpretation. But yeah, that's an interesting point. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank very yeah. much for, for handling all the questions and for your presentation. Yeah. Thank you so much. And we have to go to the next uh, next presenter. Our next presenter is, um, <clears throat> uh, is George, Jody Behura, and he will be presenting on the time-lapse quantitative seismic monitoring of CO2 plum using supervised deep learning. Okay, uh, so we all are familiar with the value of time-lapse seismic monitoring. We know that Time-lapse seismic uh, monitoring can give us extremely useful information about what's going on in the subsurface. So this slide shows us what is conventionally done. On the left, let's say we have seismic data. Using conventional processing, we can obtain an image, let's say that's on the top right, which is usually, uh, let's say, a difference between uh, migrated images uh, between a baseline and a monitor survey. The issues with uh, conventional processing are that it is time consuming, uh, unless it's a fast track project, even a fast track project can take uh, weeks. And it's quite, it's quite an expensive process. And uh, moreover, this method is mostly qualitative where 
we look at differences in amplitudes between uh, two surveys or look at uh, differences or travel time shifts uh, between uh, the baseline and monitor. Uh, one can perform quantitative uh, analysis on this, but it is not very common. We believe that machine learning can help overcome some of these challenges. Machine learning could potentially yield better physical property changes directly from seismic data, bypassing conventional processes. If we are able to do that, then this method becomes cost effective. It can be done in real time. And obviously, if you are able to predict pore pressure changes, CO2 saturation changes, then this method uh, becomes quantitative. So in this talk, I'm going to introduce a method for computing or estimating the changes in pore pressure and changes in saturation due to CO2 injection in the subsurface directly from seismic data by uh, bypassing the conventional processing flow. However, this has this method has multiple challenges involved in it. And so here I'm going to go over all those challenges and show you our approach as to how to overcome those challenges and show some results on a synthetic model uh, at the Kimberlina test site. So let's start with challenge number one. And that is the size of the data. All these applications, let's say in Silicon Valley with automated driving, uh, with, with many applications which have made AI so popular, all these algorithms deal with lots of data. For example, this slide here shows a snapshot of images from the famous ImageNet data set, which comprises of in excess of 14 million images, which are inputs and label outputs. So, so uh, what I uh, so there are tons of training images in let's say uh, many applications in the AI. But the problem with many geophysical data sets is that if we have we if we are dealing with one field in this case uh, the Sleipner field, then there's only one training example. Because let's say if you have a baseline survey, a monitor survey, you take the difference, you have only one seismic data. And that means that you have only one training example. And that does pose a significant challenge. Will this be successful? Uh, so in order to overcome this, this challenge, what we, realize, what we realize is that many of these you know, CO2 injection sites have a more or less one dimensional structure whether you look at Sleipner or uh, many of the sites that are under study in the United States have uh, are stratigraphic traps. They do not have significant structure. So they can be assumed to be locally one dimensional. And that means that we could treat each and every CMP location as an independent example. So each CMP gather will serve as a different training example. And that will imply that if we have 1,000 or 2,000 or how many over CMP gathers, we could have end up with lots of training examples. Challenge number two, and that is related to the fact that seismic gathers, the raw gathers, have axes that are pretty skewed in favor of time. So we have a, a time axis that has usually thousands of samples. The, the number of receivers on the other hand, represented by X here is a few, maybe tens or even hundreds. And so when we apply convolutional neural networks, uh, which are usually square kernels, then uh, they are not going to work well on these kind of gathers. There are many ways of doing it, but the most common way people uh, uh, do this is to decimate the time axis. Uh, that way you're throwing out information. Our approach is instead of doing throwing out uh, different time samples, we map the time axis to frequency axis. And we are able to thereby compress a lot of that information into two different axes that are pretty comparable in size. Challenge number three is training data. That is, where do we get our training data from? Because let's say you are 
you think of your own field, or in this case, I am taking the example of the Sleipner field. Yes, we have seismic data, we have, let's say, seismic images, but we do not have the ground truth. We do not know what the actual change in pore pressure is or what the change in saturation is. So we don't really have training data. So, so where do we get this training data from? There are two approaches. Uh, we believe uh, th uh, there might be other approaches, but we believe there are two approaches. One of them is, let's say you do conventional processing, you take seismic data, go through conventional working uh, workflow, and then from uh, do a quantitative analysis and come up with, let's say, a change in saturation, a change in pore pressure, and you use that in training. Uh, we believe a better method might be to perform a reservoir modeling, and that's what we use here. So what we do is, we, let's say we take a baseline reservoir model that's uh, denoted by this uh, box on the top left. And using the baseline reservoir model, we compute an elastic model from it, uh, which VP, VS, and density, and so on. And for using that uh, elastic model, you can compute baseline seismic data. Then one can perform reservoir simulation by injection of CO2, and that will result in a monitor reservoir model with a uh, monitor with, with a perturbed pore pressure, perturbed saturation. That's what this monitor reservoir model means. From this monitor reservoir model, we can again compute a perturbed elastic model with VPVS and density and so on, or other geophysical parameters if uh, we are interested. And from that, one can just perform forward simulations to get monitor seismic data. So now we have the inputs and outputs. So these gray boxes on the right from baseline seismic data, monitor seismic data, we can take some kind of difference that forms the input and then baseline reservoir model, monitor reservoir model on the left, the blue boxes that will give us the outputs for the difference between these will give the outputs for the network. And that's what's summarized here. The input to this deep learning network is a difference in seismic data between, let's say, monitor and baseline. So that's the time lapse seismic data. So this, these are CMP gathers, uh, not migrated gathers or anything. These are raw CMP gathers. And then the outputs are at that particular CMP location. What is the one dimensional uh, change in pore pressure? What is the change in uh, CO2 saturation along depth? at that particular CMP location. So uh, we can perform this, this training over uh, multiple CMP gathers and then uh, apply it to all CMP gathers or uh, future, future uh, let's say, monitor surveys. And that's what we'll see here. So we apply this methodology to the Kimberlina uh, model where CO2 was injected at a certain one, at one particular well, and uh, we have synthetic uh, data for multiple years into the future. And we are going to see here, how does this algorithm that is trained on data from let's say year one and year zero, predict the CO2 saturation and pore pressure for future monitor surveys. So what, you, what this slide shows is a change in pore pressure on the top image and the change in CO2 saturation in the bottom image. Each of these images comprises of three cross sections. The middle one is the is a horizontal cross section, and then there are two vertical cross sections. So, as I already mentioned, what we do is we take seismic data for years one and year zero, compute a difference that forms the input, and then we take the pore pressure changes, CO two saturation changes, as outputs, and perform training. And in order to really to stress test the algorithm, we do not use all the data. We use only a part of the data around the injection well. And this red box shows uh, the, the region where we take the data for training from. This comprises of 400 uh, seismic CMP gathers. So we use the data within this red box, all the CMP gathers, 400 CMP gathers within this red box. 
and the corresponding changes in pore pressure and saturation in training. And so it is super fast. Uh, I forgot to mention that we again use uh, UNET uh, convolutional uh, neural networks uh, through the UNET architecture. And then we apply this result, the, the model, to the rest of the data, to all this data. So on the left column are the ground truth, and then the middle column now is the machine learning result. The axis in this case are not exact. They're, they're similar, but not exact. What I would like to point out is that this is computationally very fast, and it can operate in sparse uh, data, and one can perform targeted imaging. I can uh, discuss more, more of this during this, uh, the question and answer session. In order to uh, analyze the, the quality of the machine learning result, let's take a look at the difference between the ground truth and the machine learning result. And this difference is shown on the right column. Again, the top is pore pressure difference, the bottom is CO2 saturation difference. The first thing I would like to point out here is that these color scales are not the same. But here, these greens correspond to zeros. So that's, that's good. It's saying that errors around the injection and going further away from there, where, where the data was not used for training, are uh, zeros, which, which is good. So it uh, means that the model is doing a good job. But when we move really far away, the one dimensional uh, assumption uh, kind of breaks down because the training, training model was expecting to see anomaly at particular depths. That's what all the training was done on. It was not expecting to see the anomaly at other depths. So it's not able to do a good job. So it's the analogy I like to give is uh, imagine Yoda from Star Wars. If someone showed you a picture of Yoda and you had never seen Yoda before, uh, you'd never really know who Yoda is. So th this red and blues here are the Yoda, which the algorithm has never seen. Now we want to see whether how this model performs for future monitor surveys. So what we do is we take that model, which was trained on data from year one and year zero, and apply it to a future monitor survey in year two. So we, so we employ the trained model. No data from year two was used in training. And so again, uh, th this is a super fast way of analyzing time-lapse data. On the left is the ground truth. And middle, again, is the machine learning result. And on the right is the difference. Again, we see that most of the changes, uh, differences in pore pressure perturbation are uh, close to zero or within acceptable error margins. The error in CO2 saturation is also acceptable. It's, it's, uh, most of these gray, gray values are close to zero. So uh, we are seeing that the model is able to analyze, quickly predict the changes in pore pressure and saturation for future years, just based on a model computed from earlier years. This slide shows the, the application of the model to data from five years down the line. Again, we are seeing that the model is able to do a decent job, but the errors are increasing, uh, especially away from the, from the well but uh, both for pore pressure perturbation as well as CO2 saturation. But qualitatively, the results are acceptable, but quantitatively, we see errors increasing. If we stress test it even further, so we are now going to go going down 20 years down the line, we see that things are breaking down now. The model is uh, qualitatively as well as quantitatively, things are not working that well. But let me, a retrain that all this analysis, all this model was developed from data from only year zero and year one and used for predict or for, let's say, inverting all future seismic data, which can be done in a fraction of seconds. So that's, that's a big advantage. So uh, what, what we have shown here is machine learning using this one-day assumption can work and give reasonable predictions of CO2 perturbations. And even extreme uh, stress tests show, show promise uh, for, of this methodology. But there are many things that need answers. One is the training data. How accurate is the training data? Uh, because we, 
and we are ignoring certain physics like uh, uh, chemical changes that might be happening. Uh, so that needs to be addressed. Moreover, model generalization. So the, it does, can the model developed for one field, for example, Sleipner be applied to some other field with minor changes? So th those, those are questions that uh, need answers. I'd like to acknowledge uh, these organizations and people involved in these organizations for help with our work. With that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thanks, Jyoti. We're almost on time. Just one question. We have time left. Sure. Uh, and we receive sure. a question online about the preconditioning. The question is, uh, is there any preconditioning applied in terms of data processing uh, for the input data sets? Or, or it was so in, the, in this case, okay, in this case, we did not apply any uh, pre-processing. Uh, no, pre no conditioning was applied. Uh, uh, but please remember that this is a synthetic study. Uh, so when we work with uh, field data, we might need to apply certain preconditioning, but I believe some uh, effects like uh, multiples uh, might not be, shouldn't be a, be, a, be a big issue, but without testing, I cannot uh, say for sure. So just the last question from me then, uh, if you mentioned that was a, a synthetic data set, was the multiple part of synthetic or multiples were excluded? Yes, if this was uh, the uh, modeling was done with uh, uh, free surface, uh, full elastic modeling uh, okay. by honoring, honoring all physics uh, that can be honored. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you for, for your presentation. And our next presenter is Anshuman Pradhan um, with a talk relating to augmenting deep learning training data for seismic reservoir characterization, methods, validation, measures, and real world application. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, of course, for the, uh, for the short introduction. All right, uh, as you can read, uh, uh, the title of the talk is augmenting deep learning training data for seismic reservoir characterization, uh, methods, validation measures, and the real world application. Uh, this work uh, was, a, was part of my PhD uh, thesis and was done under the supervision of Professor Tapan Mukherjee at Stanford University. From the previous talks, uh, we have uh, discussed uh, some common challenges uh, in applying deep learning methods to subsurface problems. And one of them being uh, the training data. Where do we get uh, the training data for uh, subsurface applications, especially uh, 3D applications. So in this talk, I'll be talking about some of these methods of how we can generate the synthetic data and some methods for uh, establishing uh, the consistency of the synthetic data with real data. And I will be presenting a real world application uh, to validate uh, uh, as in support of the proposed methods. All right, so let's quickly begin with the problem statement. Uh, the problem statement is simple. Uh, we have some 3D seismic data, and we'd like to predict a 3D model of the of the subsurface reservoir. And uh, normally, uh, we would want to want our reservoir faces model to honor uh, the geological and the geophysical uncertainty that is uh, uh, that is existing in any particular field. Uh, as as we all know, this has numerous applications in uh, reservoir forecasting and also in carbon sequestration, as we saw in the previous talk. Now, uh, coming to uh, some of the conventional methods of uh, uh, doing this seismic reservoir characterization is what we do is we generally solve a, a seismic inverse problem, right? And uh, we, when the goal is to estimate the phases, we solve a dual inverse problem. We have our seismic data D. Mm, we, we use our wave propagation model to invert for the rock elastic properties. Uh, rock elastic properties being VP, VS, and density. And then we can use a rock series model to go to the reservoir phases domain. Now you can imagine that uh, uh, solving a joint inverse problem in this high dimensional space, because now we are solving for elastic properties and reservoir phases as well, can be challenging, especially if you want to quantify the uncertainty or do Bayesian uh, analysis. Uh, what we would be uh, employing in this study is an end-to-end -end discri discriminative learning. Uh, specifically, uh, we will bypass this dual inverse problem by using deep CNNs to directly learn the uh, relationship between the seismic data D and the reservoir faces H. And we'll employ uh, deep convolution neural networks uh, to learn this, uh, 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 this relationship between the input and the output variables. As we saw from the previous talks, uh, machine learning methods, they come with their own challenges, right? So let's, let's imagine that we want to estimate 
Uh, the reservoir phase is a 3D reservoir phase model, which is denoted by H over here. G is a machine learning model here. It is parameterized by the uh, by the vector theta, uh, consisting of the network weights and the bias parameters. And in terms of the data D, we have our 3D seismic data. In order to train this machine learning model Z, uh, we need labeled data, right? Uh, multiple uh, realizations of the seismic data and and the reservoir phases model. And unfortunately, that is very hard to come by since 3D seismic data is typically collected uh, once in a field, if not a timeless uh, study. And also the labels, uh, that is the faces, are available at a sparse set of locations which are the wells. Some other challenges that uh, learning methods are prone to overfitting and also the modeling imperfections and the real data noise that is present in our real data. In order to deal with the challenges, the proposed approach uh, uh, that we present here is to uh, consist of three distinct steps. The first step is to generate the synthetic training uh, data by sampling from a prior distribution. Prior distribution meaning a prior probability distribution, which captures the geologic and the geophysical uncertainty. I will talk about this later in detail. Now, while uh, generating synthetic data is easy, uh, uh, training, uh, getting reliable predictions with the real data with all the noise is difficult, right? And for that, it is uh, necessary to establish the consistency of the synthetic data. Uh, to establish this consistency, we'll be using the prior falsification approach. And the final step is to train the CNN. But uh, as we'll see later in the study, uh, uh, using additive noise is very important in order to account for our modeling imperfections and the data noise. Let's look at the application that we'll be showing. Uh, this application is a, a gas producing reservoir from the Nile Delta, and we'll be trying to predict the reservoir phases using seismic data. The prior geological studies in this uh, uh, in this basin, so very complex uh, uh, subsurface features. For example, these are these paleo river channels, which contain this gas uh, 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 gas hydrocarbon. And our goal is to predict this complex phases bodies directly from seismic data using CNNs. Let's go to the first part where we uh, generate a synthetic training data by specifying a prior distribution. Now, uh, the approach that we follow is to specify a prior probability distribution f over our variables over here, H being phases, M being elastic properties, D being seismic data. And we decompose that as follows. For example, we specify a geologic prior distribution on phases. Then given a realization from the phases distribution, we can generate a realization of the elastic properties uh, being VP, VES, and density. And finally, we can forward model the data. And in order to generate multiple realizations of the training data, we will uh, use Monte Carlo sampling. And these are some uh, two realizations out of thousands that we generated of the of the different input uh, variables that we have. For example, faces variables over here, we consider uh, these five faces, channels, plays, shales, levees, and thin beds. Uh, we also have P velocity, S velocity, and ball density. I will just show uh, the prior distribution for the faces uh, uh, variables that we have, uh, we have shown here. Uh, the prior distribution was uh, specified using object-based uh, geostatistical models. Uh, recall from this previous slide that we have this complex sinuous bodies, right? So in order to mimic this geologic uncertainty, what we do is we specify uh, this prior distribution on different channel bodies. For example, we have a channel body over here, and this can have various uncertain parameters. For example, was the uh, volumetric fraction of the channel bodies? Was the amplitude or was the wavelength between the crests and the troughs of the channel bodies? And these are some probability distributions that we specify on each of these uncertain parameters. Now, what we can do once we specify this distribution, we can sample, uh, generate Monte Carlo samples from these probability distributions, and we can get these multiple realizations of phases, each of these realizations conforming to the prior uh, geologic uncertainty. Uh, similarly, we specified some distributions for P, S, uh, P and S wave velocity and ball density, which uh, I won't go into the details of. But uh, I will focus on the forward modeling part uh, where we generate the seismic data. Uh, in terms of the seismic data, we consider partial stack seismic data, uh, post stack, near stack, and fast stack seismic data. And these are the two realizations corresponding to the earth models that we showed in the previous slide. In order to, we, uh, we employ a convolutional single scattering forward modeling, and which we estimated the wavelets using uh, seismic to well tie at one of the wells in our study area. While generating this data is fine, uh, one of the key uh, uh, points uh, of our workflow is to generate a, a Gaussian noise realizations, which account for the real data noise and the modeling imperfect. For example, the seismic forward model that we used was just a simple convolutional forward modeling, which does not account for uh, multiples, right? So in order to account uh, for, uh, these uh, uh, for these unmodeled effects, 
and also the real data noise that we have, uh, we generate these uh, these noise realizations from a Gaussian distribution, multivariate Gaussian distribution. And I'll be happy to talk more about this in detail in the question and answer part. Okay, so till now what you've done is we've generated this synthetic training uh, uh, data. Now the next step will be to establish the consistency of the training synthetic data by prior falsification. Now let's understand why it is necessary to establish the consistency, right? For example, uh, we have this labeled training data set, synthetic data set. Now we can easily train a machine learning model to perform well on the synthetic data set. But unfortunately, the real data is not as simple as the synthetic data, right? We have uh, uh, complex uh, noise characteristics and we also have uh, unmodeled physical defects. If we train this machine learning model on the synthetic data and use the real data for predictions, then our predictions might be biased. For more intuitions into this, let's consider a very simple example. Uh, our input variables is X, one dimensional variable, output variables is Y. Let's say these blue dots represent some training data that we got get from the well. And then we see a linear relationship. Let's fit a linear regression model. This red line is our machine learning linear model. But let's say now we get data for X, which lies outside of our training data uh, distribution. Can you really uh, uh, trust? Can you really extrapolate your uh, machine learning model and make predictions? Generally, it will be dangerous because uh, extrapolation does not work as as we expect it to most of the times. So we need to ensure that our real data falls within the population of the synthetic data. And that is where prior falsification comes in. This is a, uh, the, the, the general idea is to uh, do a dimension reduction and compress and project your seismic data, synthetic seismic data into a lower dimensional space. For example, we use multi-dimensional scaling with wavelet decomposition and all of the synthetic realizations of the seismic data were projected into this two dimensional space. Now we also have a real data, which is noisy. Now we try to uh, project that into this same space. Now, if you just look at all of these data samples, you cannot tell the difference between the synthetic and the real data. In statistical terms, they come from the same, same statistical population. And this is how we establish the consistency. Obviously, there will be an iterative approach because the prior distribution that you specify will not be right in the first go. So we will need some modification, but I will not go into the detail of how we ensure that our prior distributions were consistent with the real data. Rather, I will use the rest of the time to uh, talk about the CNN and, uh, and how we tune the additive noise to account for this real data noise. So as mentioned earlier, we have this classification problem. The input to the CNN will, will be our partial stack seismic data, post stack, near stack, and fast stack. The goal is to predict our phases. Uh, uh, in terms of phases, we are trying to predict the brine sand, gas sand, and non-reservoir phases. This is uh, the 3D CNN architecture that we used. Uh, this is a busy slide. I won't uh, go into the details, but this is very uh, standard in the 3D uh, semantic segmentation literature. Basically, the input into our network goes the seismic partial stack data. Uh, this is the time axis. This is the X and Y axis. And three denotes the post stack, near stack, and the uh, partial and the fast stack data. At the at the output of our network, we predict the reservoir model that is in depth, X and Y, and three denotes the uh, the gas sand, brine sand, and the non-reservoir phases. First, I will show that we do very good on the real data, and then I will talk about how we tune the noise uh, parameter in order to make sure that our real data predictions were consistent. What I have over here is a horizon slice from the real uh, post x seismic data. And this was our CNN predicted gas sand probability. And this is the gas sand variance. The gas sand probability goes from zero to one. And you can see that while your real data seems noisy, the CNN is able to predict, identify this, this what seems like a gas channel uh, from the data. And interestingly, all of the prediction variance uh, is uh, uh, is concentrated around this gas channel because we know that seismic data has limited resolution. So the CNN correctly identifies all of the uncertainty around the edges of this gas channel. Now let's look at the cross section from the real data. This is our cross section over here. This is again the same CNN predicted gas and probability. And we can see that our CNN is able to capture these kind of troughs of uh, the gas and channels that we see uh, that are kind of apparent in our uh, real seismic data. Now, this is the gas and probability. We don't show the brine sand. So we had a gas water contact over here, which explains this large uh, amplitude, uh, this bright spot over here. And our CNN model was able to capture the, uh, the uh, gas water contact very accurately over here. In terms of the blind well, uh, let's look at one of the blind wells. Uh, we have uh, shales over here in green, gas sands in yellow. This is the gas and probability from the seismic data. 
and this is the prediction variance. And as expected from the previous results, all of the uncertainty is, uh, is uh, concentrated around this gas sand interval that we see it at the blind well. Now, these are all qualitative evaluations. Let's go into, get into more quantitative domain. In order to do a more quantitative analysis of our results, I will introduce the receiver operating characteristic curves. This is a common technique uh, for, uh, for evaluating classification accuracies. Uh, basically, what we do is we try to uh, plot the false positive rate versus the true positive rate. Let's say we're trying to predict plus positives and negatives. If our classification, uh, if our classifier, let's say the CNN over here is performing randomly, then it will classify some of the positives as, as positives, but equal number of uh, positives as negatives, right? So this is a random classifier. For a perfect classifier, uh, uh, then we'll have, uh, then the false positive rate will be zero. In other words, the area under this receiver operating characteristic curve indicates how good our uh, prediction uh, accuracy is. Let's look at some baseline prediction accuracy. We, we took our faces uh, uh, features. So we use the well log features, well logs themselves of uh, VPVS and uh, acoustic impedance. And we're trying to uh, predict on a test set of faces logs at the well. The total area under the curve is 2.8 for all of these three phases. The perfect classifier will have an area of three. So, okay, this is all well log features. This is good. But now let's see how seismic, how uh, the CNN does with seismic data and especially in the presence and in the absence of noise. In order to show that, first I will show uh, some blind synthetic case predictions from the CNN that was trained without any additive noise, right? We don't model any of that additive noise that we showed before. This was the true model, true synthetic model. And this was the CNN predicted gas sand. And what is uh, uh, like uh, really amazing is the CNN is able to capture all of the synthetic channel features that we see in our true model, like very perfectly with almost a 90% accuracy. But what happens when we predict with real data? So if we don't account for any additive noise and we use the real data to make the predictions at the wells, then this is how our ROC curves look like. Basically, the CNN is, is as good as a random classifier for, for two of these faces. So that is no good. Right? But when we account for this additive noise that we showed before, this is how uh, the, uh, the ROC curves look like. Now we have we are doing very good on those shale and gas sand faces with a total uh, area under the curve of 2.59. And th remember, this is with seismic data. If we just use well data, we were getting an area under the curve of 2.8. Now, given the limited resolution of the seismic data, this is a pretty good uh, prediction accuracy, accuracy that we get. But the key point was this modeling of additive noise. Now, obviously, uh, the real data noise to signal ratio is unknown. Uh, so how would you determine this noise to signal ratio? The approach that we chose was uh, we, we considered different ranges of uh, noise, and then we tuned that using cross-validation with the well data. For example, we have this lower bound on the noise to signal ratio and an upper bound. And then we systematically vary those lower and upper bounds. Now, these are for like two, and we show the ROC curve metric on the right over here. Now, if there is too little noise, then the model will overfit, and your prediction on the real well data will be bad. But if there is too much noise, for example, we put 100% noise, then obviously that will prevent effective training of your model. Now you have to hit a sweet spot, and we hit that for 30% uh, lower bound on the noise and 70% upper bound on the noise, and that gave us the best prediction, ROC prediction on the well validation set. So I would like to wrap up uh, by uh, uh, summarizing some of the key takeaways from, from my talk over here. Uh, we showed, we presented a method of genetic synthetic data set. And uh, this method uh, uh, relies on specifying probability distribution and sampling this probability distribution. And this is very computationally advantageous because you don't have to solve an inverse problem. You just do Monte Carlo sampling to clear the data. Set. We saw that on the synthetic uh, training data, the deep CNNs are almost are able to almost perfectly learn these complex features. But if you don't account for the real noise and these modeling imperfections, then your predictions with the real data will be biased. In order to account for robust predictions with the real data, we found the prior falsification approach and modeling of additive noise uh, to be crucial. So thank you. Uh, I would be happy to take any questions that you might have. Uh, in terms of acknowledgement, we thank Edison ENP for the data set that we had in this study. Uh, this work, uh, more details about this work can be found in our recently published paper in geophysics, which is uh, published in the upcoming May to June issue. And if you have any further questions beyond the question and answer session, you can feel, please feel free to reach me at my email.
uh, and thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, we have a couple of questions in. Uh... Okay, the first question is from Felipe Amaral. Uh, greetings and thanks for the presentation. You considered three spaces to predict. Considering some more faces than just non-reservoir would be better or worse? That's a very good question. So, um, so originally the the modeling that we do. Let me just uh, bring up the uh, the faces prior over here. Here, if you if you can see in this slide, um, we had the geo modeling is done by considering five faces. But then, uh, if we look at the VPVS and the uh, uh, and the acoustic impedance domain, the seismic data will not be uh, informative on some of these features. For example, we found that shales, uh, levees, and uh, and splays were very similar in terms of their elastic property signatures. Right, so seismic data won't be able to resolve. So that was uh, uh, that was one step that we did, one analysis that we did to identify which are the faces that seismic data is able to predict using the well data. And that's why we club together these three phases uh, to as non-reservoir phase. And obviously, if if our seismic data, if our well logs don't indicate that seismic data will be able to resolve all of these different phases, then if we introduce just extra degrees of freedom, then that will worsen your prediction. The second question is from Marwa Hussain, and uh, the question is, what's the prediction variance, and how did you calculate it? Yes. Uh, so. Uh, remember that uh, I, the output over here is a uh, is a single trial multinomial distribution, right? So that's the probability of each phases, each category for that multinomial distribution. The CNN predicts that. Now, given uh, now because it's a multinomial distribution, uh, there is an analytical formula for the variance. Uh, I don't remember it off the top of my head, but you can easily look it up on Wikipedia. So if you look up the variance for the multinomial distribution, that is just a function of the probability as predicted from the CNN. So that's how you calculate the prediction variance. The third question is uh, from an anonymous attender. And uh, hi, good topic. Do you believe this new technology application could replace the current workflow you mentioned in the beginning of the presentation? That's a, uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I, I don't think uh, it, it, like, it, it's, it's still ready to be uh, replaced yet. For example, uh, there are pros and cons to both these approaches. As I mentioned, uh, for like uh, uh, the conventional in inversion approach, that will be useful. Uh, that's useful when you have, let's say, that gives you rigorous estimates of your uncertainty. Let's say we run a Bayesian analysis, uh, it will give us a rigorous posterior distribution of the uncertainty. But coming up with a posterior distribution is challenging because of the size and the scale of our uh, problems, right? The machine learning, on the other hand, bypasses some of the steps, uh, steps by, uh, by training a model, and we get a fast prediction. But as we saw that there could be some challenges to this also, right? Uh, for example, how do you make that synthetic data consistent with the real data, and how do you account for the noise? So there are pros and cons, and I believe we still have a long way to go with the machine learning approaches. For example, how do we interpret this function that we learn and whether this function that we learn using the CNN actually replicates some of the physics that we expect from the problem. So those are some open-ended questions that need to be answered. The, uh, the fourth question is from Alfonso Reyes. And uh, the question is, is the technique that we use to find the sweet spot for noise, the ROC, uh, is there anything else you would recommend? Yeah, so uh, uh, let me bring up that slide. W one of the things that see, so when you generate synthetic data, you can also create blind synthetic cases, right? Which was not used in the training. And we found that if we use that as cross-validation, then that, that is no good because the CNNs have an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary ability of learning the underlying distribution, and that includes the synthetic distribution. This, uh, this cross-validation that we did was just by uh, uh, using the real well data. So we created a validation set with the well data, and then we tried to tune the appropriate level of noise. Obviously, this is a very manual step, right? And I, I believe there could be other ways. For example, you could, uh, you could specify, you could formulate your CNN learning problem by considering uh, the noise variable as a continuous random variable. And I believe that you can always work out and derive the gradients of the loss function with respect to this variable and optimize this. So there could be other more sophisticated approaches uh, to uh, automatically tune this noise level. But we, we did not consider that in this study. Uh, can I just... Uh... I guess I have another question. Uh, continue of the question you just answered. Uh, you're talking about like uh, synthetic uh, models and adding noise there, like in your table, you have advantage of uh, uh, adding uh, this amount of noise, right, uh, in percent-wise. But uh, how about the real data set when we 
uh, don't know how noise do you have to remove from the real data set for your uh, for your method to work is there any indication that you can suggest there uh, or apply to the real data set when we don't have advantage of adding 30 percent or 50 percent and such and such uh, right yeah yeah uh, so i i think uh, like the uh, the data that was given to us was processed and they did some denoising but still there was there was like we could see some noisy effect especially when we try to fit uh, do the seismic to well type and we could let me bring up the seismic to well type slide so we had this real traces we had this synthetic seismic traces and these are the residual traces now this could be due to the modeling uh, imperfection and also some of the noises that are present uh, you, you're right that there is no right answer to know what what is the correct amount of noise right so we didn't know what was uh, uh, we didn't have the uh, uh, good interaction with the processing uh, side of uh, processing people uh, that process this data set so that's why we just uh, randomly varied uh, uh, this this uh, this noise parameter. We consider that to be noise uh, like a uniform. Uh, uh, we consider the noise to be a Gaussian distribution, and then the signal to noise level to come from a uniform distribution with this low and upper value. But obviously, and we did that in discrete steps. So there could be other. Uh, I mean, this might not be the right amount of noise. Uh, this does well for the number of cases that we considered, but there could be other, I mean, what, I, what I'm trying to say is that you can optimize this better. Uh, I don't know if I answered a question. Yes, uh, the last question is, uh, why did you add Gaussian noise instead of other types of noise? Uh, 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 the honest answer is because it's, it's easy to model and easy to uh, sample from. Uh, and that was just the first step. And you were right, uh, like, uh, do I have a future work? So one of the if you if you look into the paper that we have in uh, uh, out in geophysics uh, this is one of the issues that we discuss is that the gaussian noise itself won't be able to capture all your uh, complex uh, uh, complex noise uh, signatures that is that we expect to present uh, in your uh, in your real data now what's the right approach of handling this noise do you uh, i mean we can always go for complex distributions right we could fit fit a non-parametric distribution, uh, let's say, let's imagine a procedure where we can fit some other, some complex distribution to the noise and try to sample from that. But then I, uh, we believe that that would defeat the whole uh, uh, purpose of this study because then the uh, the workflow gets more complicated and there are other additional variables to consider. Uh, one thing, um, uh, uh, one future work would be to consider, so why are we adding this noise in order to make the uh, deep learning model uh, overfit less? One future direction would be uh, how can we, uh, could be methods of how we can make the uh, CNN training less sensitive to this noise in the data. And that is one question that we've not answered. Uh, Gaussian noise was a very simple way to address this noise in the real data, but there could be cases uh, in, a, in, a, in a real case study where your data does not agree with a Gaussian noise and uh, and then it could uh, bias your prediction. Uh, thank you, Anshuman. That was uh, quite a good presentation. Uh, so moving on um, to the next presentation. So that will be presented by Young Ma from Amuka Research Center in Houston. And the title of the topic is uh, Combining Deep Learning and Full Waveform Inversion to Estimate Near Surface Velocity with Reversals. Uh, welcome to the session of machine learning for fascist and fault identification applications of seismic methods. So the first speaker is uh, Ruo Alohali from the University of New South Wales. The topic is automated fault detection in the Arabian Basin. Uh, hi everyone and thank you for the introduction. My name is Ruo Alohali and my co-authors in this work are Fatma Zubaydi, Prof. Martin van Kranendak and Dr. Stuart Clark. Today, I'm going to present an automated fault detection method in the Arabian Basin. This work has been done as part of my master's studies in the School of Biological, Earth, and Environmental Sciences at the University of New South Wales, UNSW. Before we start the presentation, I'll walk you through our agenda. So first, we'll have a brief history about our area of interest, then we'll talk about the methodologies and the results that we got in order to achieve our goals using an automated fault detection method, which includes both learning phase and testing phase. 
The study area is located in Saudi Arabia, which is geologically divided into two distinct regions, the Arabian Shield and the western part of the country, and it contains igneous, volcanic, and sedimentary rocks from the Precambrian Age, whereas the rest of the country is covered by younger sedimentary rocks, and it is called the Arabian Platform. The, the study area is more specifically located in the Arabian Basin, which is outlined here by the red dashed line. The Arabian Basin was subject to several tectonic events, which include net drifting, the Hyrcinian erogeny, and the formation of Zagros and Gulf of Adar Rift, which reactivated the Precambrian basement fault blocks and it affected the structure of the overlying strata. And to understand the structure, we did a full interpretation of the area, including both horizons and faults. And the full analysis is not covered in this presentation. However, we found that mapping fault structures manually requires significant time and efforts. And therefore, we came up with the idea of detecting those faults automatically. So we started exploring all of the available tools and models. And we found that most of the tools were implemented using seismic attributes or AI-driven solutions using synthetic data sets. So this is one of the examples. Here, we tested our seismic cube in the left with one of the previous convolution neural networks, CNN, that was trained using synthetic data. And the result we got is shown in image B. As you can see, the detection here is not accurate and it is full of noise. So dealing with real seismic data is more challenging, especially when, we, when it comes to complex regions with a lot of fault structures. Therefore, we decided to build and train our own model with the 3D seismic data from the Arabian Basin. So our fault detection workflow consists of two main components, the learning phase and the testing or the evaluation phase. In the learning phase, we first label our data and the total number of samples we have here is 400 for training, 167 for validation and 19 for testing. Then we use the simplified unit architecture to train our CNN. In the testing phase, we use poster processing to connect the fault line segments. And also we use other methods to evaluate the model's efficiency. And we will discuss that in more details in the next slides. As I mentioned in the previous slide, the automated workflow contains two phases. The learning phase includes the pre-processing techniques to prepare and label the data sets and the data augmentation method to expand the training data set by applying blurring, rotation, and the flipping to avoid overfitting problems. It also includes the CNN model architecture for fault segmentation. And the testing phase, we use post-processing algorithms to improve the model performance. We also use other methods in order to evaluate the model efficiency before post-processing using the intersection over union and after post-processing by calculating the average distance value. We also test the model with other public seismic volumes and we will see that later. For sample extraction, we divide our field area into two parts. The blue area shown here, we use it for training and validation data sets. And the red area, we use it for models testing. The size of each 3D seismic sample that we use is 128 in line by 128 cross line by 128 time slices. And the faults are labeled manually by slicing each 3D seismic cube into 128 2D images with the dimension of 128 by 128 pixels. The labels are created using a tool called VAT, which stands for Visual Object Tagging Tool. Then we export those labels as JSON formatted file to create fault images and converted them into 3D array in order to have labels of the same size of the seismic images. We paired those labels with the 3D seismic cubes to train and validate our CNN for fault segmentation. For CNN training, we use the simple unit architecture as I mentioned previously. Symmetric architecture consists of contracting path and expansive path. In the contracting path, the size of the image decreases while the number of filters increase. And as you can see, we first have 16, 32, then 64, and 128 for feature extraction. 
This allows the filter to learn the small details from the image in the previous layer and combine the previous knowledge to make more complex information in the next layer. In contrast, in the expansive path, the number of filters decreases and the size of the image increases to recover the size of the original image. Based on the total number of samples we have, we split our data set into 70% for training and 30% for validation. We train the CNN with 500 epochs using the patch training approach of 16 images, and we calculate the accuracy and loss per epoch. The estimated production accuracy achieved around 96% as filter detect fault features. And to minimize the error, we apply the binary cross entropy as a loss function which is commonly used for binary segmentation tasks. And to get accurate predictions, we use the Adam optimizer with a learning rate set to 0.0001 to provide the optimal model performance where the loss curve converged to 0.12. The training was done using NVIDIA GPU and it takes 25 steps to train the model. Each step took approximately 40 seconds and the full training was done in five hours and a half. Here, we have the same testing sample that we've shown previously with the old model result, but here we are comparing it with our own model. As you can see, in image C, our model achieved a greater detection accuracy with less noise comparing to image B using the old model. And to accomplish more consistent results with our fault labels, we perform post-processing. We experiment several light detection method algorithms. However, we found that the half transform provides more accurate results in our case, as it computes the line based on given parameters. And the model production is improved by approximately 77.5% based on the number of the detected faults. To test the model performance, we calculate the average value of the intersection over union of the entire test data set production before post-processing using both models, the old model that we've shown previously and ours. The proposed model provides more accurate results of about 0.12, which is over five times of the previous model result, which is 0.022. However, the intersection over union score is considered relatively low in both cases, since the CNN model could occasionally detect undesirable fault segments that were excluded from the manual labeling. Our, fo our, uh, our focus here is to obtain an accurate detection similar to the ground truth labels. Hence, we perform post-processing to eliminate false detection. Here, we introduce a new concept and we call it average distance value which measure the distance between the predicted faults before and after post-processing with the ground truth. This will help us to determine the error. And as you can see from the figure here, it shows that the results of the detection after post-processing surpass the prediction result before post-processing, which will provide more accurate estimations of the real fault. We further examined the model with the F3 3D seismic volume from Netherlands. The subset we use is considered complex zone comprising series of parallel vertical faults, as you can see in image A. The detected faults using our model are shown in image B, and the final result after post-processing are shown in image C. The model shows very promising results that indicates that it's able to detect closely spaced faults and observe fault patterns, not only with our seismic volume, but also with other seismic cubes. The size of this subset is 400 inline by 237 cross line by 160 time slices. And the computation time to generate a fault probability volume took less than 20 seconds compared to the estimated time of around three hours with the manual picking. And as you saw, that most of the faults in our study area are vertical and sub-vertical reverse faults. Thus, the model was trained to detect such type of faults, including horse and the graben, half a graben structures, and the strike slope faults. However, other non-linear fault types, such as listric faults, are not found in the study area. And thus, they are not tested and can be a direction for future studies. In summary, 
The automated fault detection method helped us to achieve more accurate prediction of about 96% and relatively low error rate of approximately 0.12. And the post-processing algorithms help to, uh, to improve the prediction result even more using the test data set by 77.5% based on the number of the detected faults. The average distance value concept that we introduce in our method help to determine the actual error between the predicted faults before and after post-processing with the ground truth. And as a result, the efficiency of identifying fault structure is improved using our model while retaining high accuracy. Here we come to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for attending and please feel free to ask if you have any questions. The first question about the labeled faults data, um, it was manually annotated or synthetic? Yeah, actually it's manually. Okay. Their second question about uh, the post-processing, uh, connecting the smaller uh, faults into one big fault. It was done manually or with some algorithm or software? As I mentioned, uh, we use a post-processing algorithm here, and uh, actually it is the half a transform. So we didn't do that manually using an algorithm. Thank you. And slide 13, uh, what about the faults on image C on the left at around 200? I think I need to share the screen again. So if we go to, if we can, if you can see here that using the, um, uh, using our model, uh, we were able to detect those faults. However, after using post-processing, because here we're using the Hoffa transform, and we need to specify uh, certain parameters, for example, the spacing between uh, the, uh, the segments and so on. So maybe this uh, fault uh, or those segments uh, does not, um, uh, does, um, are not, um, uh, considered, so that's why they were not uh, we were not able to see them here. Still have three minutes. Any questions for audience? All right, thank you for the presentation. If there is no uh, any uh, question, that's is that. I think so. Uh, we can uh, go for the another uh, the presentation, uh, which will be uh, about automatic yes. fault tracking from seismic data using the directional wavelet transform enhanced by machine learning. Uh, the speaker presented uh, by uh, Sidali uh, uh so from Algerian Petroleum Institute. So, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Sidali Watfil, uh, not Watfil, uh, from Algerian Petroleum Institute. Today, I present a piece of research related to automatic fault tracking from uh, 3D seismic data is a direction of wavelet transform enhanced by machine learning. So, uh, by uh, the objective of my, this piece of research is to implement a new technique of fault tracking from uh, 3D seismic data using the 2D wavelet factor analysis and machine learning. That our cloud spin pro uh, project located in the Gulf of Mexico uh, are used. As a plain or outline, I will start talking about the 1D fractal, fractal analysis, the holder exponent. Then we'll talk about the 2D fractal analysis and the holder exponent. After that, I will talk about the flu chart of the proposed idea and I will finalize an application or case study from a cloud screen located in the Gulf of Mexico. And I will end by conclusion definition of the 1D uh, fractal object uh, fractal analysis. So uh, simply put, fractal uh, uh, is a geometric object that is similar to itself on all scales. If, so if we zoom on a fractal object, it will be, uh, look like similar or uh, exactly like the original shape. The property is called the self-similarity. Those are some examples of a fractal object. Uh, so the ensemble of Madaburu and Julia, and this is the continuous, this is a continuous animation of the Julia ensemble. Seismic data are fractals. So, so after Strauss at 2003, the seismic data are fractal, and we can extract a lot of things from seismic data using the fractal analysis. So in this case, in the health part of the screen, so this is the author shown a procedure to calculate the fractal dimensions on the right side, section, uh, seismic uh, section, uh, where uh, the authors will highlight uh, 
salt dump using the fracture analysis. So the 3D web blood transform, we can observe the 3D web blood transform are uh, highlight, highlighting, is highlighting the, the dump of cells and the time slice of the web blood transform can precisely distinguish uh, area of salt body under consideration with high web blood coefficient. So a salt body is characterized by high web blood coefficient. Uh, the time slice for cube are similar to one uh, shown in the previous slide. So output of the multi-attribute uh, generated using the wavelet transform and the fractal bone clearly show or clearly highlight the salt body. The whole exponent uh, is, uh, is a number defined by an uh, auto holder. So fiction is uh, can set, uh, in a, on an interval satisfying the condition with alpha greater than one uh, is constant. If alpha is equal one, then function satisfies the Lipschitz condition. For any alpha greater than zero, the condition implies that the function is uniformly continuous, though the condition is called uh, uh, after auto holder. So we have a function f r x, a polynomial p n of x minus x zero. So the exponent is h of x zero, where the difference between f of x, the function f of x, and the polynomial p n of x max zero satisfies this condition. So well, we will transform has been greatly used to estimate the holder exponent. So if uh, uh, so uh, the wavelet transform is a simple convolution of a signal by the analyzing wavelength or uh, by translated and dilated, very dilated version of the wavelet, mother wavelet. Uh, mixing hat is uh, a famous uh, analyzing wavelet. This is an example of uh, analyzing of the seismic, analyzing the seismic uh, traces using the mixing hat. To the wavelet transform, so in the domain, uh, we have a wavelet of uh, uh, the wavelet as a function of x and y, or as a function of uh, the rotation angle and the scale e, i. So uh, a direction wavelet transform has two components with two analyzing wavelet c1 and c2. So where c1 is in direction x and uh, c2 is in direction uh, y. This is an example showing how to estimate the Helder exponent using the 2D direction of the transform introduced by Ernie Odo, Italian 2003. So let us define a function as uh, the power or e power minus x minus x1 power two plus b x minus x0. So the other exponent here is 0.3 corresponding to this singularity. So these are the wavelet coefficient with different analyzing wavelet. This is the maxima the materials of the web in uh, log the log scale domain. So the whole the exponent is the slope of the log of the wavelet coefficient uh, for uh, as a function as a function of log the scale. So the, the slope of this line is equal to zero point three, which is equal to the Hollar exponent. So the TG wavelet the direction of the transform can estimate the Hollar exponent or can you see the power of the singularity? This is the flow chart of the proposed idea. Is we uh, should a 3D seismic data or smooth 3D seismic uh, cube. After that, we calculate the variance attribute of the smooth data. After that, we calculate the 2D, 2D direction of the transform of each time slice of the variance attribute. After that, we map the maxima, the medial of the 2D directional wavelet uh, transform of each time slice of the variance. We estimate the holder exponent uh, using log uh, the, the medial of the direction of the transform versus log, uh, this log the scale. After that, we filter maxima of the module of the wavelet transform. Since, since maxima uh, of the wavelet uh, direction of the transform is uh, is affected by noise. After that, we uh, we use the self Gunzig map neural network neural network machine to filter the maxima. So to base it on the holder exponent. So a module is phase and the 3D uh, direction of the transform at the lower scale and all the exponent. At maxima, the module of the 3D direction of the transform are use, used as an input of the self organizing map neural network machine. So the self organizing map, Cohen self organizing map, is used to filter maxima. So to distinguish between maxima that are due to noise and the uh, and the uh, natural fractures and the maxima that are due to faults. So 
the mapped uh, fault or uh, picket fault manually are used to index for uh, self-organizing map indexation. And uh, at the end of the learning of the phase, this is an application to real data. So this is the 3D seismic cube of the cloud speed, uh, spin uh, project. This is the variance of the seismic cube, or this is time slice of the variance at uh, corresponding to t equal minus one, uh, 1,752 milliseconds. Second, millisecond, and this is the modulus of the direction wavelet transform using the 2D uh, Mexican hat as analyzing wavelet. So we can observe here that uh, the fault are highlighted using direction wavelet transform, and other shapes, other shapes are also highlighted. So this uh, this is the picture of the maxima the modulus of wave direction wavelet transform. We can observe that uh, the maxima the wavelet transform direction wavelet transform of these variance can be can be the result of uh, faults or and the noise. So the self-organizing map is used to filter uh, this maxima or to, the, to distinguish between maxima which are due to uh, faults and maxima which are due to uh, noise. So this is the map of the Haldor exponent estimated uh, uh, using linear regression of uh, log the direction of the transform this is the log, log, uh, log the scale and this is the filtered maxima using the self-organizing map uh, or the Cohonan subgonizing map. So we can observe that uh, uh, that here we, uh, we have kept only the maxima that are presenting the faults. So at the conclusion, we have implemented the new technique of automatic fault tracking from the 3D seismic data to the direction of a uh, wavelet transform of each uh, time slice of the variance attribute uh, is calculated. Maxima, the modulus of the two direction of the rest, uh, transform at map uh, are mapped and local holder exponent or estimated local experiment are you uh, at maximum the material of direction of uh, whoever transform are used as an input of a self organizing ma map to filter maxima all of the materials of the uh, direction of the transform. It means keeping maxima that are uh, the result of the faults only. Our the so uh, mapped uh, or picket fault manually are used for self organizing neural machine indexation. The proposed area can be greatly used for automatic fault tracking from the 3D seismic data and enhancing seismic interpretation. At the end, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ali, for uh, this presentation. Any question, please, from the audience? Is that maybe yourself? Yes, Ali, could you explain, please, how you try to validate after the filtering, after the self organizing? map which events are fault or which events are responsible to noise and do you have some true label data to validate this part so uh, the so the complete job is not presented here but but uh, what uh, how to validate the result so we have compared between the mapped fault using the direction of the transform and the self organizing map and the uh, and the method or picket fault manually for all all time slides. It means that we applied this uh, this uh, this protocol for. So we have two sets of data: uh, data for the training and data for the validation. After that, we run the the proposed uh, workflow to the full seismic group, and we compare between the uh, peak uh, fault uh, using the proposed uh, full chart and the peak fault using it manually. Yes, I see. Thank you. Thanks, Ali. Uh, welcome. This will be about the uh, toward combining uh, the multi seismic attributes and novel machine learning approaches. So Mustafa, uh, so, uh, Shuala. Hello, everyone. My name is Mustafa Shuala from Saudi Arabia. Today, I'm going to present a new machine learning method that combines multiple seismic attributes smartly. The project was proposed and mentored by Dr. Salih Dosari, who is a well-known principal scientist in Saudi Aramco, and Dr. Tariq Basuni from King Fahd University for Petroleum and Minerals. The project has been developed by a group of AI students who are Hussein and Nasser, Abdullah Salih, and me, uh, Mustafa Shalem. As you know, uh, seismic is the most commonly used method for oil and gas exploration. We send waves uh, underneath and leave the geophones recording the reflected propagated waves to come up with what we call it a uh, seismic data. Uh, we take the seismic through a long process and uh, one of these processes is called seismic attributes analysis. Seismic attributes analysis are measurable properties of seismic data. These properties 
could be amplitude, phase, frequency, polarity, etc. Volumes of seismic attributes nowadays are increasing every year, which makes combining these attributes a significant task. Why? Uh, because combining and integrating seismic attributes improve the ability to identify geologic features and reservoir properties. Also, combining attributes makes interpretation process much easier. And let me give you an example here. Uh, see this seismic attribute number one shows event A, uh, number two shows uh, event B, uh, seismic attribute number three shows C, and four shows D. The combined attributes is showing all the events in basically in one image. And this is the ideal case of preserving all the events in the combined uh, attribute, new attribute. This brings me to the challenge of our project. In my presentation, I'm going to first state the problem, the objective of the project, and the methodology that we used in developing our solution. Then we will test the model, show the results, and compare it with the conventional method. Last but not least, I will conclude my presentation with recommendation and future work. Here is the problem statement. One of the multi-seismic attributes of integration and combination method is called Octree, which allows us to merge up to the up to eight attributes. The main challenge in combining process, combination process, is preserving all the geologic features appearing in the in the combined attributes in one image. Oh, so here is the objective of the project, uh, which is to develop and examine a machine learning model that combines multiple seismic attributes in a way that preserves all the features of the combined attributes with hopefully better resolution and efficiency than the conventional multi-seismic attributes integration method. In the project, we examined several clustering methods and neural network models like k-means, SOM, and autoencoder. We found that autoencoder gives better results in our experiment. So what is autoencoder? Autoencoder is a dimensionality reduction algorithm based on a neural network, and it can be categorized as self-supervised algorithm or unsupervised al algorithm since the input and output is the same data. The main goal of this technique is to learn the important features from the input data, and it does this by trying to compress the data into a lower dimension. The autoencoder network consists of an encoder and decoder. Encoder it tries to encode the input to a lower dimension, which is the encoded features, and the decoder is exactly the opposite. It uses this encoded features to reconstruct the input. It is important to note that, to note that the actual data uh, we are interested in is the output of, of the encoder. While the output of the decoder could be used to optimize the network as a good reconstruction would mean that the data was encoded correctly. As I stated previously, the encoder tries to capture the important features in the data, and it does so so by lowering the number of features, which is here in our case in neuron, at each layer. In this example, the input consists of uh, 10 neurons or features. In the second layer, it has uh, eight. This is the same. Uh, uh, consequently, this would force the network to learn eight good features from the given 10. This is the same of all the encoder layers until we reach the number of features desired. The decoder does the opposite as it takes the encoded features and it tries to learn more more features from it. This is this is done for all the layers in the decoder until we reach uh, the original number of features. Uh, the the autoencoder has very useful advantages. One is only uh, it only requires the original input data, so no need for labeling data, and it does it does not require any other input labels. Uh, two, it learns to extract the features automatically, so no intervention intervention from the user is needed. This is useful as it would mean that this technique capture the important features from the attributes without the need of the interpreter. And this is why we call it smart combination. Uh, autoencoder is mostly used for image compression uh, by reducing the dimension of the image. And also it's used for image denoising. Since we reduce the dimension of the uh, image at each layer, the network would learn which pixel is actually important and which is not uh, just a, no a noise. Note the output of a clean image is the, uh, this is the output of the decoder. The the challenge now is how we can use autoencoder for our problem, which combining multiple images. The structure we talked about previously cannot be used for our problem for 
for two reasons. One, our input consists of multiple images, and each image needs to be flattened to capture a huge number of parameters since each pixel would be represented as a neuron. And a training the algorithm would be really very expensive. Number two, uh, by flattening the images, we risk losing the spatial information, which is not desirable for our case. So what is the solution? Our solution is to use a convolution layer. This layer uses a filter, uh, the kernel, that convolves through the image and, it, uh, and its channels, then produce a feature map at the output. This solves the two issues we talk about. The number of parameters is independent of the images, images dimension, and since they are not flattened and the filter is looping through the images instead, we would not lose any spatial information. Here is an example. Uh, you can see here the uh, RGB image and a three by three filter going around the, the, the image. It consists of three channels, red, green, and blue. Therefore, the kernel also has three channels. At each time step, the results from the three kernels is added, which represents uh, a one single pixel in the output feature map. To do so, we need uh, to think about our attributes as a single 2D image, but with multiple channels, where each channel represents a different attribute. Note that by cons considering this, in theory, we could have unlimited number of attributes stacked together as a channels, thus merging a limited number of attributes. Okay. So now we are ready to prepare our data. In our case, we have three, uh, five volumes, the original data, the raw data, and the four attributes. First, we take, uh, we uh, we make slices. In our cases, we divide the volume into 102D slices. And every, uh, the, the, the volume here is uh, in time scale. So in every five millisecond, we stack um, five slices from the input till we reach the, the 100 uh, milliseconds. So our data here consists of four dimensions. The first dimension is the number of slices, which is here in our case 100. Then X and Y, which are the dimension of the image, in our case here 221 to 171. And the last dimension is the number of attributes, which is in our case here five attributes. Here is the network structure. Then we then we feed the images to our uh, encoder network. It starts with 32 kernels, where each one captures the features from the different attributes. Then we reduce the number of kernels to 16, then 8, and finally a single filter that captured the features from the multiple attributes. The decoder is just the opposite of the encoder. It takes the encoded attribute and it tries to create more feature maps. And at the last layer, we use five filters to reconstruct the five input attributes. This is the full network consisting of the encoder and decoder parts we talk about. At the end uh, of the reconstructed and the original image are compared, and MSE, mean squared error, is used to update the weights for all the layer. Results and discussion. For fault and fracture detection, we examine and compare the results of Octree as the conventional multi-seismic uh, quantization method and autoencoder as, as a new machine learning technique. Here is the output of the conventional method. And it looks like it missed two events here, which is B and C. And I think this is due to the raw data here, the influence of the raw data. See the output of the smart solution. It shows not only it shows only the, the, the three events, but also with better resolution. And you can here observe the fractures coming from the fifth attribute all here preserved in our solution. There are other examples here with the different time uh, intervals. And uh, it show, uh, the encoded image, which is our solution, shows better result from the octree, which is the conventional method. Here is another example, another example. See, this is really very good uh, example uh, showing the high resolution, which is a uh, way better than conventional method. Uh, as conclusion, uh, as you can see, um, the machine learning technique, autoencoder, preserves all the features, which is here in our case, faults and fractures, from the combined attributes and shows better resolution than Octree. It can also combine unlimited number of attributes, which is not the case in Octree that's limited only to eight attributes. For future work, as Dr. Saleh Dosari said, uh, we plan to run the new algorithm on more data sets to test the algorithm in production. And also, we also plan to invest in the 3D extension of the algorithm 
for further research. Uh, by this, I'm done with my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mustafa. Uh, any questions? It's a dimension reduction. Thanks. Uh, that's a very interesting. Uh, so have you noticed, for example, uh, the any smearing of the uh, the small features, uh, stratigraphic uh, elements uh, when you applied it, and uh, or uh, so probably uh, you are further uh, trying to uh, so develop it 3D uh, the methodology. Uh, which will uh, so protect those the smearing. Again, can you rephrase the question? Yes, and uh, so have you uh, mentioned in, by implementing this methodology any smearing uh, where you are about to losing the uh, small uh, the features, the stratigraphic uh, the features on the attributes? Uh, as you can see here, the results really amazing, and it shows yeah. all the minor very, features. Very encouraging. Uh, yeah, and uh, and that's really get uh, yeah, the the result. Even I couldn't uh, because you know the network is a black box. You don't you don't you have no control on it, and you just leave it, and you can see. And also the MSE is not an actual error measures because uh, the 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 measure is the eyes of the inter interpreters. We give the results to the the Dr. Saeed Dosari and the other uh, interpreters, and they judge whether uh, this is good combination or good results or not. And it, it looks like it's really more preserved even the minor fractures, which is really amazing. However, we, we cannot rely on one test. We need further testing to really make sure that this technique preserves all the features and not missing anyone. The number of the kernels, uh, three by three, the bean of the kernels at all the way through, or you're starting from the big kernel and uh, reducing up to the uh, so three by three bean kernel? Yeah, or all it's three, constants, uh, all three by three. All three by three, yes. Uh, the one that we use is just three by three. Here there's a uh, question in slide 18 what you are doing is a dimension transformation no i'm, uh, I'm not quite sure if this is a dimension transformation this is the question i think what you are doing as a dimension transformation again so can 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 you turn the slide uh, let's go 18? okay yeah. sure sure you mean this one uh i'm not sure because it's just convolution approach yeah this okay uh, you said uh, 28, it's uh, slide 28, right? I think you showed the transformation between encoder and decoder when transformed 2D image to 1D pattern. Mm, yes. Uh, I'm not quite sure if it is dimension transformation, but here, what, all what we do is convolution. We just reducing the, 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 the features. I'm not quite sure if if this is what you mean, transformation. I'm not transforming a dimension to another dimension. I'm just reducing the number of features. As you see the convolution method here, which is basically uh, every time we convolve uh, here. This is, and I think this is a really good animation here. It shows exactly what we, uh, what we mean here. In every layer, we just convolve um, like kind of a plug of, to uh, one sing single uh, pixel here. And we keep going till we reach to the desired feature map. Mustafa, one yes. question from my, my side. So sure. as you know, uh, when you are using encoder or decoder, it's very similar to GNA network. So mm -hmm. you need to create very clear or um, good organized latent space, or let's say primary support information. So did you create a specific latent space based on extracted features uh, or you use only original attributes as input data? Uh, we use the second, we use the original one. Yeah, yeah. But, okay, did you try to extract some features uh, to give it as latent space or primary information? And no, um, no, no, but however, we, we we're trying uh, to improve the extra the feature extraction by by giving more weights for example for for uh, like, let me give you here example some features like uh, let me show you here this one for example the skeleton it's really good and i want i don't want to get influenced by the raw data i want to give only a less influence uh, from the raw data till uh, the skeleton. What I tried basically, I just multiple uh, mul uh, give this another dimension or uh, 
I repeat this data set. So instead of uh, having the skeleton only one, I have it two, skeleton one, skeleton two. This, uh, so I give more weight or concentration on skeleton more than the raw data. And I think this give, uh, will, um, will give, will dispute the weights to to the seismic attributes that I'm really careful about preserving that the events there. Are you sure that you you are able to control specific features based on the weights? Because no, no, definitely no. I'm just we're just trying by try and error because it, it uh, no control in preserving the features. But uh, we're yeah. we're trying to influence the network. Yeah. Okay, it, it means trial and error. Just uh, yeah, trial and error. Do, yes, do, doing. Okay, I, I see. So one more question, question from the chat. I'm missing something. You have five inputs and one output. This mm -hmm. is a question. Is this trained on examples? If so, how did you create the targets? So it means the label data, output data. That's a very good question. Uh, you see here, this conventional method, this is the this is the output from the use, from the interpreters. So the interpreter, they expect to see a result similar to this or better. So when I result, when I get the result, this is an equivalent to the conventional uh, result here. Uh, we do not have labeled images, but we have the conven the solutions using Octree, and we compare it with our solution. But is this supervised learning? It is, uh, I think, supervised learning. And the question is, uh, no, it you... is not supervised learning. You it's see here, okay. yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not feeding, I'm not feeding Octree results into the network. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm, uh, we don't have labels, and and I'm just giving this to the encoder and. The, the network itself, it forces the, or I'm, I'm forcing the network to get the, the most important features and leave till we get the desired features. Uh, but the network has nothing, uh, doesn't know the result should be similar to this. Yes, I have, I am using the MSE error uh, to just compare between the decode Encoded results and they encode it. It should they should be the same. Yeah, but this is I'm using it for for the training. Okay, uh, I think we should. Uh, thank you, Mustafa. We should move to the next presenter. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you very thank much, you. Mustafa. Next presenter on the list: uh, intelligent recognition of seismic flashes in clastic reservoir and its application by uh, so Leo uh, Heining. Good afternoon, distinguished scholars and experts. I'm Liu Heining. The topic of my report today is intelligent recognition of seismic fishes in plastic reservoir and its application. We will divide the import into three parts, including formulation, algorithm, and the researches. First of all, we will introduce the background of our method. Seismic phases analysis is the key to sedimentary phases and the reservoir prediction. Moreover, the seismic phases pattern highly unifies the sedimentary theory and practical knowledge, and its accurate establishment is the basis and constraint for realizing computer intelligent recognition. Under the circumstance, we proposed a digital pattern library based intelligent recognition method of seismic phases, of seismic fishes. First, based on the existing studies of single wild sedimentary, sedimentary fishes model, a typical seismic fishes model library is established by incorporating the characteristics of seismic waveform, consequently forming a digital representation method of seismic fishes model library based on texture parameters and moment invariant parameters of seismic in-phase chain code. Eventually, the random forest intelligent identification method is applied to classify different seismic fishes, which could realize the intelligent recognition of seismic fishes and shows high resolution in predicting macrophysis in river sedimentary system. Secondly, we will introduce the algorithm we used in our method, that is random forest, which could be shortened to RF. The basis of the, the RF algorithm is decision tree algorithm. The decision tree algorithm performs recursive segmentation of the sample space according to the data characteristics of the training site and then forms a series of recursive discriminant rules organized in tree structure. Random forest can overcome the limitation of single model by constructing forest composed of a large number of decision trees randomly and in both them, they are 
output to make the final prediction. Random forest classification algorithm has many advantages, such as independent of any model hypothesis, high dimensional space adaptability, high prediction accuracy in any classification form, and low likelihood to overthink. Finally, we will introduce the researches we did in Chengdao area, Shengli oil fur, taking the flavia species species deposition as an example. The sedimentary macrophages macro combination type is firstly determined by seismic, by seismic logging and the lithological data, which is shown in figure one. The first three are the main oil storage taps in Chengdao area, Shengli oil field, and the latter two are mainly used as cap rock or lateral barrier because of their poor physical properties. Then, according to the five combination modes mentioned in figure one, five typical sand groups of target layer one, two, two, three, two, three, three, four, one, and four, three are selected to carry out the statistical statistical analysis of seismic wave from, uh, form where 100 samples involving 38 exploratory males are summed up. Each combination, each combination has different refle reflection characteristics on the seismic waveform. For example, the sand body thickness of a, sand, of a single beach in a beach combination has a certain correlation, amplitude, and frequency as demonstrated in, demonstrated in figure two. On the seismic section, it is mainly composed of the bell-shaped reflection with smooth waveform or the superposition of two bell-shaped reflection with smooth waveform. Next, based on the numerical characters of seismic, seismic fishes model and the seismic fishes configuration, the three sedimentary macrophages, macrophages of flavia fishes, natural dike and flood plain are alter, automatically, automatically identified by using the random forest identification method. The prediction results of the random forest method are shown in figure three. From the prediction results, it can be seen that the distribution of each sedimentary macrophages, macrophages of the River fishes is cons consistent with the geological laws. The beach shape of the main channel location is clear, and some small channels can also be clearly ident identified, thereby showing a high resolution as a whole. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, yeah, I mean, is that uh, supervised learning? And uh, because you provide a description of how the faces look like, different faces, right? Sure. Flat yes. plain, natural levee, and so who could decides that this is flat plane? And uh, I think that we should decide it in our... And we proposed it based on the, the existing studies of single whale sedimentary faces model, such as this, such as this figure one. It, it shows lithological lister, combination characteristics of flavia sedimentary macrophases, and uh, the one to five repre, represent, represent flood plains or side beach, natural levee or side beach, side beach or side beach, flood plain or, set, or natural levee, and uh, flood plains from left to right. You can see that. Okay, thank you. The first question it was, uh, are you using any synthetic during the convolution to get this uh, fascist any synthetic red wavelets mm. and the second question it was uh, the uh, which uh, the kind of input data you are using the reflectivity or uh, so the impedance inversion data um uh, i can answer the second question the uh, the input uh, attribute of seismic uh, in fact we do, uh, we don't have a have a limit on um on which kind of uh, attribute you use we just uh, put, put all the attributes we have and uh, and the machine learning model could find the best combination of them thank you all right thank you any other questions uh yes my life next who is going to yeah is sorry for uh, wrong pronunciation uh the topic is identification of turbidity channels for seismic data using artificial neural network hello good morning so so good morning again. Uh, my name is uh, Kaik Carvalho. I'm from the Federal University of uh, Minas Gerais here in Brazil. So I will present this work um, titled uh, Identification of Turbidite Channels from Seismic Data Using Artificial Neural Networks. So this work I developed here with my colleagues from uh, the Federal University of Minas Gerais and also from Petrobras, and some of the members are also uh, studied in the uh, Colorado School of Mines and University of 
Houston. First, we need to understand here that the interpretation of uh, seismic data is a long and uh, subjective process. Uh, what we, we are trying to do here is to uh, apply some um, machine learning techniques and uh, kind of to automate this process of interpretation and to locate some of the spots, uh, kind of the, the zones of interest in the seismic data. So the question here is if we may apply these uh, machine learning techniques, can they be useful to identify, for example, in this example here, uh, turbidite channels? Uh, the outline was a little introduction about general, general concepts of machine learning and artificial neural networks. Uh, then we'll present the geology setting and uh, the methodology that we applied, uh, the results and conclusions. So first of all, I'm sure everyone here already knows, but just to explain uh, the types of machine learning, uh, I know that yesterday there was an interesting discussion about it. And today after my presentation, uh, there will be again more about this. We have uh, supervised learning uh, that basically we train uh, the machine learning algorithm, the uh, neural network with input data and uh, labels, right? the uh, expected output data, uh, output, uh, expected output. And the unsupervised learning, we train uh, the network with only the input data. So algorithm finds for, for itself uh, how to uh, train the data. And reinforcement learning, I won't get into too much detail here, but uh, we also have uh, different types of uh, kind of semi-supervised learning and other types of, of machine learning in general. Uh, so uh, the one we used in this work was uh, supervised learning. So we give the network the input data and the labels for this data to train the network. So basically here, just another picture to explain this. So we have uh, the input data and we have the starting uh, weights for our neural network uh, with random values and with the correct output and the output from uh, this first interaction here, we calculate the error and we use an optimizer to update these weights until we get best result. So and here just a picture to explain the uh, math behind it. So uh, the one we used here was a, a very simple methodology. So a very simple uh, neural network. So it's a basically fully connected network, which is uh, the calculus is based only on uh, matrix multiplication. Basically, uh, we have if we have like uh, an array as an input value, and we have more than one neuron in each layer. So we have a matrix for the weights and and this matrix will be multiplied by our input value and then sum together, sum with the bias and, and then we will we'll be the input for an activation function. And then we have our output. Uh, there are a lot of other works the uh, just to mention a few the, the works from Zhang, Waldel, and Obafemi that neural networks applied to these uh, sort of uh, problems of uh, geophysical problems of identification and uh, reservoirs, for example. So the geology setting. So we have the data that we use here is a synthetic data, but the turbidite channel region was based on some uh, real was calculated. Uh, from uh, real uh, petroelastic models of P wave, S wave, and and density 3D models. So basically, only the turbidite channel is uh, based on the uh, real petroelastic data that is based on a, a field from the campus basin here in Brazil, uh, in the pulse salt uh, region of the basin, and that is called the Marimba field. So the rest of the data is synthetic. It took only the turbidite channel is based on this petroelastic models and the rest was uh, synthetic. Uh, the seismic data that we have is something like that, the picture that we see here. So uh, the, our methodology uh, is it was very simple for this first attempt here. So we have like seismic sections from uh, 251 units of length here or pixels, we can say pixels as well, uh, on the depth and uh, 646. What we did was to split uh, these sections in two smaller parts of 32 by 32 pixels. And then we label each of these smaller parts of the picture as a channel or a non-channel or a host rock, as we called here. So in this case, we have, for example, these B and C smaller parts uh, we can label as uh, the channel, the uh, smaller sections from the turbidite channel. And for example, A and D, 
we label as the host rock for this case. And so we got, um, I don't know, don't remember exact, the exact number, but kind of a hundred sections like that. And, and we split into these smaller, um, smaller pictures. So uh, uh, at the end, we had kind of a thousand of these labels, right? So, so the network that we used was about uh, three layers and the optimizer that we used was the stochastic gradient descent uh, from a tensor flow, which uh, there is known as the Adam optimizer. And the last function was the binary cross entropy function since the labels uh, here we have is binary, right? Uh, host rock or channel. Uh, okay, so after we train the, the neural network, then we can see here just some, some of the uh, results for each uh, of the pictures that we, we split for a separate test. So uh, for the for the training data, uh, we split, of course, into into training, testing, and validation uh, data. So, but we also uh, separated some pictures for uh, an after test, sort of like a blind test. And here are some of the results for this. So the classifier here for this picture classifies as a host rock. Uh, for this one as a host rock. Uh, this one, uh, we can see that it, it got some of the uh, channel region, so we uh, correctly classified as a channel. And this picture here is kind of ambiguous, right? So it takes a smaller part of the channel and some part of the uh, host rock. So here it classifies as a host rock, but uh, the picture is ambiguous. So uh, this methodology has this kind of problems. Sometimes the data can can be ambiguous. So, but here are the results that we have. After we classified the smaller pictures, what we did was create a mask for the entire section. Okay, so uh, we we separate some some sections for uh, these kind of blind test, and we classify each of the 32 by 32 uh, smaller pictures for, from it and we used it to create the entire mask. So what we see here on pictures A and C is, is a manual interpretation. So it's the interpretation of a geoscientist and it's overlaid with the uh, synthetic seismic data. So the synthetic seismic data is kind of at the end and, the, and this interpretation of the geoscientist at the top. So these masks here are created uh, from the geoscientist interpretation. And at B and D, we have our results. So it's the mask created by our classifier and they are overlaid by the geoscientist interpretation. So we can see that a, since it was a simple methodology uh, and considering the way we labeled the data and we use the input data, so we get this kind of, of, of squared shape mask, right? But it, it got right for the most part of the channel, right? And here for this case as well. So most of the channel was correctly labeled, correctly classified by our uh, network, even though it was a, a very simple methodology. The accuracy here was uh, 90% for during the training and also uh, was around 90% when we take, we kind of calculate the entire area of the section of the channel on the section and we calculate the area that the neural network correctly classified as being the channel region, the channel area. Here the conclusion, so the training model works well in distinguishing uh, the, these two different uh, seismic phases, two different labels in the data, right? As if it's a host rock or a turbidite channel. And the algorithm reached a kind of a high accuracy as 90% during training. And also after when we consider the area of the channel on the section. And we also conclude that it has a, a possibility of application on real and field data since the, the data that we use here was basically uh, synthetic seismic data, except for the uh, the synthetic except for, sorry for the turbidite region of the turbidite channel and so that's all i'd like to thank everyone for watching and thank my colleagues that contributed for this work and uh, we have some time for questions now so thank you uh, thank you very much kayak very interesting uh, any questions yes uh one quick question so did you uh do some sensitivity analysis uh to identify how kernel size impacts on recognition of seismic fascists the kernel size for what sorry uh, 
I mean the size of uh, filters of convolutional neural network. Did you um, analyze how these sizes uh, impact uh, on the recognition of seismic fascias? Oh, no, no. We didn't get to, the, to this analysis yet, but uh, it's a good idea. For, ah, this is uh, 1D convolutional layers? Oh, no, this is not convolution. This is uh, simple, fully connected networks. Basic, the architecture that we use here is uh, similar to, for example, when you use the simple TensorFlow example for identify like uh, handwritten numbers, you know, for just one, two, You three. mean Mini's data set, yes? So the question uh, is, yes. uh, can, can, you, uh, can you describe the architecture of, uh, or can you categorize the network uh, as CNN network or a hybrid network CNN with MLP or what kind of network uh, did you use? Uh, we, because TensorFlow we just li library based on yes. which which layers you applied to TensorFlow. Yes, well, we used uh, the TensorFlow library, the QRS uh, function, but like the layers that we used in the network, we, we didn't use any convolutional layers, you know. We used just the, the basically QRS uh, neural network sort of layer. Uh, I, I think that the data set that TensorFlow uses for like handwritten numbers is MNIST, you, you know? So Yes, yes, yes. We, uh, MN, we did, IST, yeah. yes. Yes, yes. But you can apply so, the network so-called MLP, multi-layer perceptron, or CNN. Maybe I didn't get the architecture during your presentation. Uh, I didn't show here the, the architecture uh, at the presentation, but uh, we use uh, basically uh, just uh, this uh, fully connected. I don't know if I can get a better picture here to show you. Let me see if I have really fast, if I can find. Uh, but we uh, this work was a very simple methodology. Now we use for this what we call uh, segmentation, right? Uh, semantic segmentation to identify the, the channel. I don't know if you see my screen. Or... Yeah, so can you move to network part? So, oh, here are the layers that we use. Uh, yes, this is just see? MLP, yeah, MLP, yes, because yes. You, you are using only dense layers. Yes. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So we have uh, another question. How do you estimate correctness of channel classification? What were your KPIs? So it means your uh, objective function. What is your objective function and how you define the quality of your results? Uh, the yeah I'm not sure about uh, the names here for but uh, the functions that I use for like the metrics that we used was accuracy in, in the uh, tensorflow function and the loss function was a uh, binary cross entropy uh, function and that's how we use the the metrics to get okay Th this metrics. metrics is at the level of network but I think the question is how you estimate how you define the quality of your results based on what data so key performance indicators uh, performance are you indicators. Uh, uh, are you well dating your results on some true data with well data and true data with well data for example yes oh no no blind only QC, any blind qc oh no it's basically just a seismic section so uh, the data that we use here are 3d data so to kind of validate this data and uh, we took some sections that are far away from the the sections that we trained. We did everything on, only on seismic data. And my question, actually, by your uh, synthetic seismic data, you are creating from the uh, petroelastic model, which is you are creating yes. the petroelastic model, the PVS density from the log data, and uh, then generating the synthetic. And that uh, synthetic seismic is input for this uh, the workflow. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. But uh, the the petroelastic models that I used, I, I didn't work uh, right on that part. In, on that part, yes, thank you. I see. But yeah. Yeah, but we already got like a three D model for this uh, P wave, S wave, and and density. So I don't know if there was any well log data involved in creating these three D uh, models, you know. But yeah. I, uh, okay. it, it already came to me as a three D model for this mm -hmm. I, see. I just wanted to ask, I think it's a similar question uh, about the KPIs, but let me ask you this. You asked, I have 90% accuracy, right? So that 90% was with regards to something, right? So you something you assumed 100%, you know, and what is that something? Can you explain why is it yeah, 90 rel relative to what? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. So, um, so the 90% was both on the accuracy 
on the network during training, but it was it also was 90% accuracy when I took like the, for example, this mask here, I got the, uh, the entire area of the channel. Oh no, sorry here. So the channel, uh, the area that was, was labeled as, as a channel by the, the geoscientist. So, so I took it as a hundred percent, as you said, you, you know, as being a hundred percent correct. And then I took the area that it was labeled you sorry it was classified as a channel by the by the algorithm and i and i just took the difference of the area so it was basically this i, I don't know if it's the correct evaluation for that but it was also uh, another evaluation that i took but the accuracy mm -hmm. during the training of the was also kind of 90 percent around okay can okay. i make a comment on this sure. I, yes, I, I think you, you are you are reasoning completely as a data scientist and not as a seismic interpreter because the the 90 percent is is indeed true in terms of the classification results that you have but if i look at your results b and d then for a seismic interpretation interpreter this is really not the way you would like to uh, to get your results back you would like to see something which is reflecting more or less what, what is shown in A and B. And I, I think you, you can actually improve your results considerably if, if you classify your data differently. And the way I understand what you're doing right now is that you have these squares of 32 by 32 samples, and then you classify the whole square as either sand or non-sand or reservoir, non-reservoir. Um, that, that gives this blocky result. And yes. if you would use that target on the left, which has been interpreted by an interpreter, create a mask of it and sample that mask as your target. So you move your square over it to present either zeros and ones within the square, if your output is also a square, or if the output is only a, a zero, then you try to predict the central position of that square and both can be extracted from these examples in A and C and then you can test it on another line that has been interpreted and uh, and then you get a result which is much more geologically meaningful which to me as an interpreter would would be really the target not just to have a data scientific nice result but especially something that an interpreter can be using directly so i, I would mm. put really my focus on what is it that the interpreter likes to see and that's what I should uh, try to deliver. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the comment. Uh, and that's like what we are trying to do right now with, with the semantic segmentation. Now we can label this pixel by pixel, you know, so mm -hmm. we have something closer that, that, that you are proposing here. Yeah, so this was I, a, I, I saw when you showed your uh, your desktop that you are, are using Open Detect. You, you can very easily create these masks in, in Open Detect. And then, and then you have something to label your data. Okay, thank you. Uh, and thank you. One more uh, recommendation. I think that MLP type networks are not uh, is not able to solve the geometrical topological problems uh, because you have the 3D structure, 2D structure, and it would be nice to apply the networks which are able to recognize the geometrical topological objects. For example, the CNN network, at least 2D CNN network. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Ike. Kai, thank you. All right, so we have uh, so the one more, last but not least, uh, so uh, the presentation by uh, Paul de Groot. This will be about 3D seismic fascist segmentation using supervised and unsupervised learning uh, approaches. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, 3D seismic uh, fascist segmentation using supervised and unsupervised learning approaches. And I'll first uh, introduce the subject, then I'll show you examples of unsupervised workflows, then of supervised workflows, and I'll conclude with a few takeaways. To start, uh, let me uh, apologize because my title is officially not correct. If you really look at the definition of seismic uh, phages, then that is, according to the AAPG wiki, mappable three-dimensional seismic units composed of groups of reflections whose parameters differ from those of adjacent phages units. That means these are large scale objects that you can see at the macro scale in the seismic data. The example here is uh, a seismic phages cube that was created from one interpretation. So an interpreter identified uh, nine different uh, phages on this one line and then the algorithm created a volume based on this interpretation. I find that personally totally uninteresting because I just see blobs of, uh, of data which have no geological meaning to me. 
I, I rather see a number of horizons and other patches uh, with, which might be of interest. Uh, for example, in the previous talk, we saw these, uh, these turbidite uh, channels. If you can identify those, yes, that is of interest. And if you can see a salt body, yes, that is of interest. But something like this with the classical seismic phages is not really interesting. It becomes more and more interesting if you go to a much smaller scale, and that is the scale of seismic geomorphology. Geomorphology is the seismic study of buried landforms of mapped surfaces and the sedimentary and erosional process processes that shape these landforms. This is the level where we see channels and we see all kinds of interesting features that uh, make up our reservoirs and that are really of interest to an interpreter. And basically the difference between seismic phages as defined uh, officially and seismic geomorphology is, is a matter of vertical scale. Uh, the focus of this talk is on uh, geomorphology. So how can we actually get results that are interesting for a seismic interpreter? And the two learning approaches that I will address are supervised and unsupervised. We've seen that uh, before and there was a discussion uh, yesterday on what is supervised and what is unsupervised. I think it's, it's still uh, good to really emphasize this that supervised learning is an approach to learning under supervision from an intelligent source. It needs labeled inputs and outputs. It's training by example. And unsupervised learning is a competitive learning approach in which you just try to find structure in the data. And because the algorithm is, is not fed any input, it is creating something, a clustering of the data that gives you then new insights into uh, the data and Hopefully, it gives you uh, interpretation uh, capabilities because you're seeing the data in a different way that triggers your geologic mind. Uh, for instance, the example here on the right, that is an unsupervised approach. And that means I see nice patterns in the data. These patterns reflect different seismic waveforms. But these seismic waveforms, these patterns still need to be interpreted in terms of their geologic meaning. So unsupervised means interpretation is done post-application. Supervised means I need to have interpreted or simulated data to train the algorithm. Now let's look at unsupervised workflows. And this particular workflow, unsupervised waveform segmentation, has been with us uh, since the 1990s. Um, there are two popular uh, networks to do this. There's the unsupervised factor quantizer and there's the Cohonen network. And the way we have implemented uh, our unsupervised factor quantizer is such that we cluster the data, we find the cluster centers, and then we do a sorting of these cluster centers so that when we apply colors to these, these waveforms, we also see gradual changes in the, uh, in the color scheme. And that means that our unsupervised factor quantizer plus this sorting of the output is equivalent to a Cohonen network, because in a Cohonen network, you do get this sorting automatically. Now, what is happening in, in an unsupervised waveform segmentation is you need a mapped horizon. At least this is the uh, original approach. And around this mapped horizon, you're extracting a piece of the seismic, and that is a trace segment or a waveform. And the amplitudes uh, in this time window, you are then feeding into a neural network in this unsupervised factor quantizer that is. So in this display over here, we see five amplitudes are going into these five nodes of the network. The user then defines how many segments he wants to segment the data in. In this particular example, that is three segments. And once the network has learned to find the cluster centers, because this network is also trained on a subset of the data, you give it uh, just a random uh, set of uh, waveforms that have been extracted along the horizon, then the network finds the cluster centers. And once these net, uh, cluster centers have been found, then in the post-processing, the network compares the input with the cluster centers and it outputs the, the winning segment as one of the outputs. It also compares how close is this particular trace sec to the cluster center, the winning cluster center. And that is a, a second output, which is called the match value between zero and one, which gives us a confidence in this, uh, in this uh, segmentation. Now let's look at uh, how this works uh, in practice. We have here a data set from the Netherlands. It's uh, under the city of Delft. And uh, we've mapped the horizon. That is this one, which is the top 
of the Holland. And now we want to do a waveform segmentation. So we're going to extract a small uh, piece around this uh, waveform. And we're going to segment it in this case into 50 different uh, clusters or different, different uh, segments. Now, what you see here is the result of this waveform segmentation. And here we see the 50 different cluster centers that have been found in the training of this, uh, this particular network. Again, the colors here just indicate that we have similar seismic response as we see here in the cluster center. It doesn't say anything about what this means in terms of geology. That is what I, as an interpreter, still have to find out. I have to do the interpretation post-application. Note that in this particular case, because we wanted to say something about uh, the Holland formation here, and we have mapped the top of the Holland, that our waveform, the trace segment, is extracted not symmetrical about around this top, top Holland interpretation, but uh, slightly above, but mainly below it. And here we see the entire clustering along the seismic inline and crossline. Again, we need to interpret this. So that is the task of the interpreter. Now let's look at, at that we can also do this in three dimensions. So the, the original waveform segmentation uh, was always applied in 2D. Recently, Friso Brouwer of i3Geo uh, created this results, which is basically the same approach, but now segmenting a complete volume in uh, 3D based on the waveforms. Now you're not extracting the uh, the waveforms uh, along the horizon, but you're just randomly uh, selecting waveforms from this volume, train the UVQ to find the waveforms. And here we see the, uh, the different waveforms. And also this is uh, segmented into 50 different outputs. Now in this particular example, uh, Friso did not uh, use reflectivity seismic as input, but he used color inverted uh, acoustic impedance. And uh, that is handy in the interpretation because now we are looking more at layer properties and everything that we look at a, a horizon slice taken from this volume can then be take, interpreted as being symmetrical against this uh, horizon, saying something about the properties of that layer at that uh, position or the characteristics. Now to do this and to do the interpretation, you really want to slice through the data in a meaningful way. And a meaningful way is basically slicing along horizons. So in this case, Friso created a horizon cube, which is a dense set of horizons that follow Groner uh, stratigraphic uh, events. And here we see a stack of these horizons. Now let's look at uh, some interpretation. What we see here on the left is the uh, relative impedance. So this is the color inverted data. And uh, we see some nice uh, channels here. And here we see the waveform seg segmented data and the waveform clusters. Now, what, uh, what we uh, see immediately at this uh, lowest level in this uh, interpretation interval is that this is characterized by narrow, chaotic, and strongly meandering uh, channels. If we look at A over here and over here, and that represents the depositional fairway, the boundaries of the depositional fairway. So within this uh, fairway, we have the sedimentation. In B, we, uh, we recognize uh, some splays over here. C, of course, is a clear oxbow. D is uh, similar relative acoustic impedance, but still they are clustered in a different uh, clustering. In E, we see that the, uh, the channel, this one here, terminates in this dendritic uh, zone F. And we see from the waveforms that C, E, and F have a soft uh, signature. And in this particular case, that may uh, uh, represent a good reservoir quality sense. The data set, by the way, is from New Zealand. It's the Maui data set. Uh, over the Maui field. Now we move a little bit uh, higher up and we see at the stratigraphic level uh, slice number four that we now have two main uh, main channels, A and F. This is uh, channel F here. Let's go back. Channel A is a meandering uh, sinuous channel and channel, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm in the wrong slice, this one. Um, so here we have channel F with which four, there we are, sorry, this is, my lower level uh, channel F is a meandering uh, channel and channel A is much more linear channel and it ends in these two lobes 
B. In C, we now interpret levies on either side of this uh, channel. G again is an oxbow. D is a splay or a lobe. And E is interpreted as overbank uh, deposits. A, B, and G have a hard signature, possibly indicating lesser quality reservoir. And now we come at the highest uh, level, and now channel A has become the more dominant channel. It's becoming wider, and we see that the acoustic impedance contrast has almost disappeared. We just can barely see it meandering still over here. Uh, we recognize clearly point bars B, and these are hard have a hard signature, therefore possibly indicating lesser quality uh, scents or reservoirs. And in C, we see some uh, overbank uh, deposits. Now, that, that is the way to, to work with unsupervised uh, methods to generate these, uh, these cubes. This is very easy. It's mainly uh, pressing the, a, a few buttons and you get uh, the results. But the interpretation has to be done post-application. Now we come to supervised workflows. And that is, of course, completely different. And we have, we have seen uh, different methods over the last couple of days uh, of supervised methods. And, and basically, in seismic interpretation, there are two main things that you can do to create the labels that you need for supervised work. On the one hand, there is simulation. So can you model the actual problem? If you can, then that can be work, work very well, as, as we have seen from fault interpretations. Uh, most trained models uh, have been trained initially on synthetic uh, fault cubes. And typically, these are of a shape 128 by 128 by 128 samples. If we look at seismic phases and especially geomorphological features, then that is much more difficult. I know that some research groups are working on this, but the problem is still how to create realistic uh, geological patterns and geological models that, that represent the variations that we can expect in the real seismic in such a way that we can use these models and the synthetic seismic response derived from these models to actually train machine learning models. So modeling works in some cases, but not in all cases. The other cases, you have to rely on interpretation. And then there are two different uh, possibilities, which have a huge impact on how you proceed and what you will actually get. And that is the type of uh, models that you can actually train on and what you can interpret. Um, so we basically have two different machine learning models in, in that can be used for in, interpreted uh, data. There is the models that go from an image to an image, like a unit. And there is the models that go from an image to a point, like a convolutional neural network or a multi-layer perceptron. And that makes a huge difference in the way we can train it, but also in what we can actually interpret. Uh, if, we, if we can interpret something at the macro scale, at the seismic scale, like a horizon or maybe a salt dome, then it's, it's really preferred to go that way because these image-to-image uh, models, once they are trained, they are extremely fast to apply. And they also have potential to be reused. And like if I have trained uh, a model for predicting salt, and then it's very uh, well possible that that same model can be applied on a different unseen data set. And the application is extremely fast. And this, this is really where we can apply units. The slider that we see here, the interpreter interpreted one line. It drew this polygon of the salt uh, outline. Then he created a mask from this, uh, this interpretation. The mask is a seismic section with ones and zero, one where it is salt, zero where it is not salt. And then a 2D unit was trained on the seismic input to this mask. And when you apply this uh, to the unit, you get a 3D interpretation of the salt body. Now, that, that is fantastic if you can do it, but the problem is that you cannot interpret everything. It's much easier to interpret points, and then you have to rely on these image-to-point type of models. So if we do interpretation of points, um, then we can use that on the seismic uh, scale. And then we have a tool like a paintbrush to really create uh, big uh, blobs of, uh, of data. And then we sample these uh, blobs. We extract the information that we need, uh, either in the form of attributes or in the form of small cuplets centered on these points. And then we train a CNN or a multi-layer perceptron. Training times are generally short, but it takes an enormous long time to apply, especially if you have large blocks of data going in. 
and only one output at every sample position. And the, uh, the other thing that you can do is, and that is the, uh, oh, the one that I would like to show in this talk, is we can use a tile wake tracker to create the points that we need. The labels, so the targets that we want to, uh, uh, to train on, can be generated with a tile wake tracker. And I'll explain what a tile wake tracker in my next uh, few slides. We can use this for, uh, for phages and geomorphological type of uh, uh, objectives. And because this is really happening at, at a very small seismic scale where you cannot really interpret uh, the bodies with a polygon or manually. So you have to rely on this uh, point interpretation type of exercise. Now, let me uh, show you what we can do then. What is a tile wake tracker? A tile wake tracker is uh, a form of a connectivity tracker. A uh, tile wake in itself is defined as the... Uh, lowest elevation within a valley of a water course and in the seismic we define it as uh, an amplitude tracker that follows in three dimensions the path of le least resistance now how does that work as i said it's a connectivity filter or a connectivity tracker that means that once I have one seed position, I will evaluate all the different uh, neighbors around this uh, position and I will see which one can I add to this growing body. And whereas in a normal connectivity tracker, you would add all the points that fall within the constraints. In a Tawake tracker, you only add the best neighbor, the best cell that fulfills this, uh, this property. And with what is defined as the best, if I and tracking a positive amplitude, then the most positive value of all the neighbors is the cell that will be added. And in this way, I'm adding one cell per iteration. And that gives me a few very nice uh, properties. Here we see an example where I started tracking from this particular position and I tracked 50,000 uh, cells. And you see that each time I added the cell, it actually followed this channel path. So apparently the amplitudes are organized such that, uh, that we can follow this uh, sedimentation path by just adding cells in this particular way. And from the colors, I can see which cell was added at which particular time. The nice thing about this tracker is that if I start tracking from another position, like for instance, in this small inset, you can see I started from here. I get exactly the same body back. The same channel is tracked, but now the history is different because I'm adding new cells from this position rather than from over here. And that gives me an interesting property in my uh, goal for creating examples for my machine learning model. Because now I know if I track from a particular position, for instance, in this case, 50,000 points, I can see that all these points belong to the channel phages. So I can use all these points as targets for a machine learning model. But if I track it for 80,000 cells, then at some point it will start spilling into another phages. And this is clearly a splay phages. So I know now where the splay is and I can just redial to get a body which should not split, uh, split into a next uh, phages. And in this particular way, I can uh, use this tracker for finding geomological features like channels, sand waves, uh, but it also works in carbonates uh, like reefs uh, and all kinds of different uh, features. It's really uh, peculiar that uh, this Talwick tracker works like this, that there is much more in the organization of amplitudes than we have realized uh, so far. And by using the tracker in this way, we actually exploit this organization of the amplitudes. Apparently, there is an imprint in uh, the amplitudes of the sedimentation process. Here's an example of how we actually uh, used this to create different labels for a seismic uh, geomorphological uh, uh, phages analysis. On the right, we see here in this, uh, in this picture, uh, we see different uh, seismic uh, phages. And what we did here is we, we tracked it from different positions and we looked at the shape and the uh, relative position of the different emerging bodies what these shapes actually meant. And then we, uh, we generated so eight different groups of points, starting always from positive and negative amplitude. So we have four positive uh, channels, four negative channels, and so on. Um, and we ensure that all the, uh, uh, the classes that we create in this way have uh, more or less identical number of points. In this case, 1,500 points were created per class, and we downsampled the classes with too many points. And we merged sets with uh, from different seeds which had not enough points. So then, at each 
of these positions, uh, we're going to extract a small cubelet from the seismic data. And the cubelet in this case has the shape of a pizza box. It's 41 samples by 41 samples by three samples in height centered around this uh, each position. And the task of the machine learning algorithm, in this case, a LeNet type of convolutional neural network, is to classify the data into these eight different classes based on these examples that we give it. And here we see uh, the results. We have uh, negative and positive uh, groups. Uh, we see uh, channels, we see unconfined channels, we see floodplains and uh, splays. And in order to display this we uh, we flatten the data in uh, in the wheeler space so we created again a horizon cube and then we flattened the data and now we're slicing at different time levels in this wheeler space which means that we are looking at different horizons chronologically um, and we see the different patterns emerging and of course because this is a supervised approach the colors now do have meaning. They actually mean or indicate the labels that it was trained on. Now, the problem with this approach is that it takes an enormous long time to process uh, because we are doing an image to point type of uh, machine learning uh, application. It means that at every sample position, we extract this pizza box, pass it through the machine learning model, and we just get one sample position output and that we have to do for the entire interval of interest. Now, to save processing time, we can stop the process at some point and we say, okay, now we have enough examples to do an image to image uh, type of application. And then what we do is we train a neural network, in this case, a 3D unit from the seismic input to map to this, this output that we have created with the LeNet uh, network. And then we apply the 3D unit and we get the full volume. And, and that saves us enormous uh, amount of processing time. The, the training takes maybe uh, 12 hours. The unit, it trains uh, on 128 by 128 samples. The application is a matter of minutes. Now, what are the takeaways uh, of this particular talk? Uh, we've seen unsupervised and supervised segmentations. Unsupervised segmentation is really very easy. The workflows are extremely easy and you get a result almost immediately. Problem is that you just get nice colors and you get nice patterns but you still have to do the interpretation post application. In supervised segmentation, uh, that is more difficult to generate because you need labeled inputs and you can either create labeled inputs for image to image data or for sorry for image to image models or for image to point models if uh, you want to go for an image to image model then you uh, either need to simulate the data or you have to interpret and then you need to interpret at the macro scale so you have to draw polygons or horizons or whatever you can draw that is what you then turn into a mask and then you can use it. Um, that is not always possible for all interpretations. So then you have to rely on an image to point workflow. And this requires interpretation of points, but interpretation of points is, is very much easier than interpretation of body outlines. And what I've shown you is one particular example on how to create these labels using a Talweg uh, tracker. Uh, by the output of the Talweg tracker, is interpreted as groups and as uh, the shapes and the outlines and the relative positions to each other is how you can use, uh, you can actually give a geological meaning to these uh, tailway tracked points. Now, image to image models, finally, they take uh, much longer to train. Uh, it's, it's a day or half a day versus minutes, 10 minutes, uh, and you require much more compute capacity, especially GPU capacity. But once you have such a model and you have trained it, it's extremely fast to apply. And it also has potential to be reused on unseen data more than image to point models. So if you can, and that depends on the interpretation or the modeling, I would always recommend to go for image to image type of workflows. I would like to uh, acknowledge the uh, governments of the Netherlands and New Zealand for uh, the use of their data. Special thanks to Friso Brouwer, of Ivory Geo for the 3D waveform segmentation example, and to Sergey Formel and Jingming Wu for sharing their current research on seismic phase segmentation with me. Unfortunately, I could not include these examples as that would have taken too much time. That is my last slide, so I'm now open for questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Paul. It's a brilliant presentation. Thanks. Any questions? I think this presentation can be used as the guidance for the guys who want to apply deep learning and machine learning for the 
geophysical problems. I have some question. Before, uh, I think at the beginning of the presentation, you you said that you are not using RC data as input. You are using colored inverted data. As I know, uh, the colored inverted data requires low frequency part constructed from log data. And does it mean that the approach cannot be used for the field where we have no well data or you can change the input data to give the scalability for the approach no no you you can uh, do this uh, also on uh, uh, reflectivity data um, but if you want to do the interpretation especially with unsupervised uh, work it is easier if you are uh, working on color inverted uh, data because then you can immediately transform in your head. I'm looking at a soft layer or a hard layer, uh, etc. And uh, yeah, if, if you have reflectivity uh, data, that is that is more difficult uh, because you're looking at boundaries rather than layers. So That's it's just uh, an interpretation. Yes, yeah, yes, it's an interpretation issue. Yes, thank you. We so, have a question uh, by uh, the Shen. The nice presentation. It seems that the seismic facies sure. classification using machine learning application is quite mature. Do you agree? If yes, what kind of uh, ML model is the best one, et cetera, CNN or other algorithms? Yeah, I, I, I don't think this, this is really um, mature yet. I think we only uh, see now applications uh, emerging that, that are really becoming interesting. In, in terms of the uh, supervised approach, uh, I think the UNET, the 3D UNET is, uh, is the most uh, widely used method algorithm and uh, we also use that uh, most often as it gives uh, really interesting uh, results. You can almost map anything to anything. The only question is that you need to know input and output and you need to have these matching inputs and targets. Uh, the labels, as we as we call it, um, and how to generate that. Once you have that, and, and the unit gives enormous uh, amount of, of options and possibilities to transform one data set into another data set. I also think that the unsupervised method has been uh, underutilized. Uh, the, the waveform segmentation on horizons has been with us uh, for, for 25 years uh, Plus, um, and and that is, uh, I think, well established. But the the three D waveform segmentation, as shown here from the example uh, created by uh, by uh, by Friso Brower, is is, is really uh, very new. And uh, I've I've seen a lot of three D segmentations in the past. I've never found any results uh, interesting uh, because it always uh, showed the blobbies, blobs, which which had no geological uh, meaning. You could not make the transformation from a geological blob into something that, that had geologic meaning. What Friso did here with, with just an extension of the UVQ uh, waveform segmentation in 3D gives a result that is that is really interesting because I can interpret it, I can see things which really have geologic uh, meaning. And, and therefore, I think this, this method, because it is so simple, uh, has uh, still a lot of uh, potential to be used uh, much more. Um, yeah, and <clears throat> in terms of uh, supervised methods, it, it's really depending on what you can interpret or what you can model to uh, in, in what you can get out of it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Paul. We have got another uh, the question in the chat box. Uh, how do the uh, UEQ method from the 90s compare to the current deep learning ML algorithms? I, I have not seen any good unsupervised methods uh, popping up in the deep learning space that yeah that can compare with what we are doing here the, the UVQ the Cohonen uh, and and K means uh, clustering is is they're all pretty uh, similar but it, it's still unbeatable in terms of uh, the the speed and the uh, the way this can uh, this, this can generate easy results quite quickly and I, I know there are new algorithms uh, coming up but i've not seen any results which are better than what uh, what we have been doing since the 1990s at least not in the unsupervised uh, space okay hey, method. Uh, Paul, uh, one more question did you have the experience or did you check the performance of the so-called physics-based deep learning approaches techniques where we can replace the abstract ways to some mathematical operators for example in last years we have a quite popular direction where where researchers works on physics-based LSTM network for full wave on inversion, for example. I'm not sure if I if I understand the uh, the question correctly, but I, I think that, the, that, that the, there's the question yeah. is. 
did, did you check some networks where we can integrate the physics based uh, knowledge? For example, we replace the abstract weights of the network uh, with some mathematical apparatus, for example, differential okay, yeah, apparatus. Yeah. No, or... no, I, I have no experience with that. Okay, so we have another question. What do you think about semi supervised learning? I, I think that is, that is uh, interesting because uh, the main problem we have with uh, supervised learning is, is how to create these labels. And in semi-supervised uh, learning, you, you have just a small amount of uh, examples, and then you combine that with uh, uninterpreted or unlabeled uh, data. So it, it becomes a much more uh, fight between the two uh, models to, to actually come up with the best uh, results. So you can do with less uh, labels and less interpretations and still get an interesting result. So I think there is a lot of uh, future there for these algorithms. I know that uh, uh, Qingming Wu is working on this. Uh, one question uh, from me again. If we have got uh, the semi-supervised method that unlabeled that data, but uh, a complex geology, then uh, that will be, uh, so for example, if the heterogeneity is uh, so more, then complexity uh, will increase. So yeah, in it, case... it, it, there is there's a general trend that the uh, the models become bigger and bigger. And indeed, the, the models become complexer. Uh, in, in the early 1990s, when I uh, first uh, started with neural networks, it, it was always very uh, straightforward. You had a multi-layer perceptron and, and a UVQ, and networks were really simple, one layer, one hidden layer, uh, and, and one output layer. And, and now we see uh, networks that have become so complex that nobody understands what's, uh, what's going on anymore in, inside these networks. Um, so that, that's definitely a, a trend. It, it has not become easier in that respect. Um, but also what we see is that these new algorithms can actually do things which were completely unthinkable of uh, just uh, a few years ago. So that, that's the positive side. I, I think what, what we are going to see in the future is, is that we uh, we see a, a fusion of data scientists and geoscientists and I think that is that is needed we need to have people who understand both sides of the uh, of, of the domain and not not just data scientists who, who create and, and generate something which is not useful for geoscientists and a geoscientist who understand what uh, what is happening in the machine learning versus uh, what what can this particular model or workflow give me what is possible when I interpret this can I use it and, and so on. So that, that, that is where I think uh, we, we see a, a big need for, for people who understand both domains. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Paul. Okay. That was great. Uh, any question from audience? I think we covered all questions from the chat. And Yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for all attendees and for presenters. Thanks, Paul. It was nice to listen. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Your thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. We have the discussion and summary section at the last, I think. Yeah, we have we have uh, so the question by mm -hmm. Alfonso Reyes. Yep. Would the UVQ be considered a machine learning algorithm? Uh, yes, I, I think we, we always think uh, Many people think that neural networks is uh, is machine learning, but machine learning is basically any technique where you uh, you try to uh, yeah to to either extract information or to to train an algorithm that uh, that it can learn from data. That there are many more algorithms than just uh, neural networks. There's the ensemble techniques, the random forest, the decision trees, the unsupervised uh, methods, uh, clustering techniques, uh, the deep learning stuff, and, and all of these are algorithms that you could group under the term uh, machine learning, which in itself is, is yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. I Sorry, I I, I just uh, uh, I just uh, would like to just uh, raise a question about for everyone to discuss the because I I am not quite sure uh, do all of you to believe the machine learning technology will fundamentally change the job science or just uh, as a supplementary technology because we know that the machine learning or the uh, artificial intelligence has dramatically changed a uh, lot of aspects of uh, the other industries such. As the car as driving, you know, even the communication ways. So I don't know uh, what will happen for our just science. What, what, what's your opinions for all of you? What exactly we, do you want to know? Yeah, I mean, the, the machine learning technology will be the uh, core 
for the uh, game changer of for the just science or just uh, work as a supplementary technology. So which means it's not the will not be the primary technology, just uh, secondary. Based on we call it a, a conventional. But I think the question is: Can machine learning or deep learning be the uh, important? computational approach for geoscience in the future. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, yeah. I, I, I think that that is in a different way you could ask, are we uh, seeing a hype or or is this uh, something that will stay with us? And if, if we look at artificial intelligence and machine learning, then I, I think we, we are witnessing now the, the third wave of, of a hype cycle. The hype cycle is typically something which goes up uh, very fast. Uh, there's a lot of interest. And then at some point, uh, there's a problem that nobody can solve or uh, the, the expectations are not uh, met and then it uh, wanes off, but but still it's being used. And then in this uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, so we, we have witnessed this uh, three times. And where we are at the moment is definitely uh, in, in an enormous interest in, in this uh, technology. And there's a lot of things happening which are uh, very, very interesting and, and are also changing the way we are doing our work. And But the question now is whether this will at some point flatten off or whether it will just go down again at some point where you say, okay, the it didn't quite meet the expectations. That, that of course, is very difficult uh, to depend uh, to, to actually uh, predict. But what, what we can see if we look back in the history from artificial intelligence, which, which started in the, uh, the 1930s, basically, uh, with, with, with more theoretical work. Uh, and then we had a second wave, uh, which was in the 90s, uh, 1980s, 1990s, with the neural networks, the shallow neural networks, as we call them now. And now we, see we are in the third with the deep learning uh, algorithms. We, we always see that, that it is being used more and more. So it, it's, it's, there's always a step uh, towards more uh, usage and whether it will completely uh, revolutionize uh, our business or whether it will be a very uh, valuable addition. That is, that is to me uh, still a question, but I, I, I'm pretty sure that a lot of the things that we are seeing developed right now will be uh, used uh, as standard technology uh, in the coming uh, years. Because, uh, because I, I noticed some, some, some uh, professionals call it the uh, next generation technology for the jazz science. I'm not quite sure is it the real or next generation or not, but I, 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 really, I really believe it's, it's, uh, it's better than the conventional uh, method in some aspects. As one is the uh, pathophysical, such as the uh, just yesterday, there is a topic about the how to predict the law curves uh, using machine learning. Uh, another one topic is you just uh, introduced the uh, seismic physics classification. I believe these, at least these two aspects are are quite uh, promising if we use uh, a machine learning application compared with the conventional uh, technology. I think it's very important what Paul, Paul said that it's very important to have both uh, the engineers uh, who has both knowledge as a domain launch and uh, deep learning because only the combination of both knowledge can uh, accelerate the process of success. Uh, I think it's not enough to have experience only in data science or only in geoscience because domain knowledge is uh, the priority to build the success model of, for example, the true uh, architecture of deep learning because it cannot be separate from each other. Oh, okay, okay. But, but such kind of the uh, professional are very difficult to, to, to train or to, you know, it looks like you have to hold a bachelor degree in geoscience science and then you study master degree in data science. Very difficult, yeah. you know. At least uh, because of the country I work in China, you know, I ask everyone, <laughs> nobody know about the data science and they, in the same time, he know about the data science. <laughs> Yeah, when, when we uh, developed our machine learning uh, solution in OpenDetect, we, we designed it for three types of uh, geoscientists. That, uh, we, we, we see we have researchers who really want to, to code and to do all kinds of uh, things. And then we have experimental uh, geoscientists who really want to play with data and, and, 
um, yeah, get the most out of uh, their data, and uh, they're not afraid of doing uh, yeah really complex uh, stuff. But then the majority of of the the interpreters they really want to have very very easy uh, workflows, and they don't have time to actually spend on on getting into the nitty gritty of how to do these things. And I I think there is a possibility that you can serve all three of them because a lot of these uh, these models. Uh, can actually be reused. And, and that is why we as a philosophy have now uh, are, are building a library of trained models that can be reapplied. And that means that uh, if, if you have a problem, like uh, you have a noisy data set, you could just pick up a, a model that has been trained to remove that kind of noise. And then you apply it. And, and especially if this is an image to image model, it would be extremely fast. So if in a few minutes you have a new volume, which is cleaned up and then you, you either you like it or you don't but that is the way to actually actually serve the the majority of the of the people i think we we are spending a lot of time nowadays and especially researchers they they spend four years on the, on a phd and then and at the end they they share their results uh, in the form of uh, free source code on github but that, but that is also the the graveyard of of their research because even if it's brilliant research Nobody can actually reuse a source code that was developed by a researcher because it's it's not meant to be reused by uh, by others. So it it's it's unfortunate, but a lot of this uh, brilliant uh, research is, is just not being picked up. But on the other hand, if if this researcher at the end of his research would have created a trained model that could be reused, for instance, to predict uh, missing logs or to, uh, to predict something from the seismic or to remove something or detect some kind of uh, ob- object in the seismic, then it's very easy to reuse that model because then you would just pick it up and, and reapply it and, and see if it's useful to you. So that, that's why we are focusing on building this library of trained models. Okay, okay, thank you. Would the UVQ be considered a machine learning algorithm? It is answered, I think. Previously, the second one also, yes. I think we can close the session. This is the uh, schedule for uh, tomorrow. Same time, same connection link. I'd like to thank all of the presenters. Thank you very much, Paul, for joining us. And thanks for all the co-chairs uh, doing an excellent job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank everyone. everyone. Thank you, Laurie.